Hi, John. Hey, hello. I, I just uh, I just got done muting everybody, uh, which I'll do, you know, which I do between each each comment. Just people's uh, microphones end up being open and then we hear the barking dog or the complaining wife or kids in the background or a fan or feedback or something like that. So, so we've got a couple more minutes, one more mi minute here until, uh, until we get going and we get 66 people on right at this point and uh, we'll wait, wait for it to ramp up. Um, and we've already got, we've already got some questions here on the, on the chat. So I'll go over all that in just a minute. Nice to see everybody tonight. It's a pleasure indeed. My most recent seminar was with the Toronto MG Car Club. That was just a small group. Um, and it might have been 25 people involved, just that. And uh, if you're from a club and you'd like to have me do a seminar just for your club, and it's smaller and you can get, I can get a lot more detailed here. You know, somebody gets into something real specific about their overdrive and it's like, you know, there's another hundred questions waiting and I can't spend that much time. Um, but there's a lot more banter on, in a smaller group and, and we can dance back and forth between questions and answers and so forth. So, well, seven o'clock, so I, I want to get going. First of all, you'll recognize um, that in the background, I've got, I've got something new. It makes me sort of pixelated around the edges. Um, but this is provided to me by Simon Dix from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, we had, uh, he sent it to me reversed. We, I got my daughter to reverse it. So I made a positive and put it up and, and now it works good. So maybe it'd work better if I had a green screen behind me because I know right along the edges here, you know, stuff happens in my hands. Uh, it's it's kind of it's kind of weird how it all works. But if I stay relatively um, immobile, um, then then it ought to work a whole lot greater than if I start dancing around and and we'll lose lose stuff in the background. So th the way this works, we got 91 participants on right now. Um, there's a chat section on the right, so you can post your question there, and I just take them one, two, three and get into it as deeply as I, as I can, as much time as I've got uh, to an answer your question. A couple of times throughout the whole process, I'll make my unabashed pitch for going to my um, website and finding the PayPal button um, and pressing that and, and making a, a small donation. I've got small donations, I've got big donations. It's very kind of, of everyone to participate and help me, you know, help me pay my expenses too. You know, I went to my insurance man and I said, now I'm just doing this, I'm just, you know, giving advice. He goes, oh, you need insurance for that. So I, you know, I pay, I pay insurance every month. So in case I, I don't know, if I tell somebody their brakes aren't important, you know, and they go out and crash and then I don't know that I, why would a, a lawyer look here? I no deep pockets here, but Anyway, who knows? So anyway, I, I've got expenses that I, I've got to pay for, for doing all this. So anyway, I appreciate everyone's contribution and, and how it all works. Um, I want to say thanks. Um, this is not a complete list. I, I'm, I'm always behind in thanking people. Um, but from the PayPal contributions over the little past little while, I've got Daryl Griffin, Richard Gardner, Norm Block, Bob Lee, Mark Coor, Doug Clark, Chris Aslett, Tom Talone, David Vincent, Phil Ryan. I saw Phil right when I turned on. He's about the first guy on. Jim Har Hargrove, Brennan Cox. Thank you, Brennan. He's very kind. Judson Chapin, Lynn Garner. So just because I didn't read your name didn't mean that I didn't get your, your uh, donation. And anyway, thank you very much for, for helping out. Tonight, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about awakening in MG or a TR6, if you own one of those, um, after a long period of rest. I mean, like a long period. So this guy calls me up on Thursday and I stopped at his house on Friday. I hadn't seen him to talk to him for about 25 years. And that's how long his MGC has been sitting in his garage. Engines frozen, oh boy. Big. And I said, well, look, Let's look at the whole the whole picture. I say I got my hands up and they don't they don't come up. I'm just going to have to talk. Um, 
I said, let's look at the whole picture. It's cheaper to push it out in front and call the trash man and have somebody take it away. That's cheaper. Um, have them take it away, go out and buy a really nice MGC, write a check for 20 grand, just buy somebody else's. It's all done, it's all great, it drives, hey, you know, have a great time. Well, he says, I can't do that. Great. So now he wants to fix this up. And I said, all right, so now the next, the next easiest thing to do <clears throat> is take it to my old shop, Rusty Moose Garage, and um, talk to Forrest and, and you know, and, and I said, but, you know, it, it could cost you a hundred grand, a hundred grand, he said. I said, well, it needs an engine, it needs brakes, it needs suspension, uh, there's rust on the body and the interior shot. You know, where, where do you want to stop? My, uh, my last ex-wife asked me one time, she said, I don't get it. Why would, why would someone spend $100,000 on a car that's only worth $20,000? Seems upside down. I, I always responded with, do you know anyone who owns a cat? So anyway, you can spend a lot of money on our cars and they don't die. They're always re revivable. Anyway, my, my friend, a customer, said, well, both those options were out of the picture and that is throwing his away and buying another one or writing a check for the whole thing. So you're stuck with doing as much of it as you can yourself. So remember the first and most important part of the car is the brakes. So this is an MGC. So there's a uh, three grand there, something like that between the servos and the master cylinders and the, and the clutch hydraulics and the front calipers and maybe not three grand, maybe two grand. Um, getting all that stuff rebuilt and getting it set, put back in the car. After that, you've got um, to do what we used to call in my shop, the complete lubrication, which is a hundred point, drain everything out, refill everything, grease everything, go for that. Um, you need new battery, you need new tires, most certainly. I gotta look at my notes here. Um, um, so we're stuck with, <laughs> we're stuck with the stuck engine. So what do you do? Don't take it apart. Don't take it apart. Get it freed up in place. So I told him, take the spark plugs out, get a can of some kind of penetrant, PB blaster, breakaway. There's all kinds of stuff you can get. Put it in the cylinders, strip off the right-hand side of the engine. So the distributor's out of the way, the oil filter on the MGC is out of the way, the alternator's out of the way, and get a great long bar, two-foot-long bar, Take the starter motor out, wedge this bar between the teeth of the flywheel and the backing plate, and try to make the flywheel move. You try it one way, try it the other way, doesn't move, wait till tomorrow. Every day you try it. One day, one day, it'll be free. It'll move. And then you get past the rust spot, and now, now the, you can turn the engine um, 300 and 59 degrees until it catches again in the rusty spot. So now since the brakes are all done, stuff like that, you can put a, a tow strap on the front of it and go pull it around the block at uh, 30 miles an hour in second gear and really make that engine work. It gets oil pressure. Um, of course, you should have changed the oil prior to this, but now you get oil pressure, the engine's loosened up. You go through the distributor, you go through the carburetors, you know, you put gas in it. Maybe you got to empty the old gas out first and start it up. Start it up. You know, it'll, it'll run. It'll run. How well does it run? I don't know. So then you go out on the expressway and you go out in after, you know, after you test it around the house a little bit, um, you go down the expressway and you put a couple of hundred miles on it. Carry water, carry oil, uh, carry your cell phone, um, and, mm -hmm. and just see, see what, what, what happens. Sometimes the rings will seat back in there okay. Maybe it's not tremendous. Maybe there's a little puff of blue smoke. Maybe if you keep track of your, of your uh, oil consumption, uh, the oil consumption is one quart every 500. Well, I, you know, I don't know. An MGC engine, when I left full-time in the trade, the engines were about $1,000 per cylinder. So um, an MGC engine would be about $6,000. So you can buy a lot of oil for 6,000 bucks. So, I mean, if it's smoking too much, you're chewing up, you know, two, two three quarts of a tank full of gas, and it's embarrassing to drive because it smokes so much and stuff. But get it going first and shake it down. Maybe you forgot that the second gear synchro doesn't work so well. 
you know, shake the whole thing down. So anyway, that's kind of reviving it. Bells, hoses, you want to do that, that kind of stuff. But go for the brakes first. Remember the three most important parts of the car are the brakes, the steering, and the brake lights. After that, who cares? Um, you don't need wipers because you're not going to drive it in the rain. You don't need lights because you're not going to drive it at night. You know, you don't even need an engine because you're, you're going to coast downhill. You need brakes and steering and brake lights to keep the guy behind you from running up into you, you know, for not knowing what, what's going on. So that's my couple of comments about that. I was going to go to the shop today and bring my favorite wrench, bring my favorite spanner. I put that in my, in my note to everybody. I don't know how many people saw it, um, but if, if you've got a, if you've got a, a favorite spanner, um, you can, you can show it to us. Here, I put, put my hand up. It's sorry. If I put my hand up in front of my face, I guess I can see it. Um, anyway, um, my favorite, my favorite spanners, wrenches, are Dowidat, D-O-W-I-D-A-T. And they say on them, made in Germany. I've had them for 40 years. Well, 40 years ago, there wasn't a Germany. There was a West Germany and the People's Democratic Republic, whatever East Germany was, there wasn't a Germany. So that means that those wrenches date from before the Second World War, which started today in 1939. So anyway, old old uh, old spanners. I got some. I got some real special ones that I, I love. So anyway, if you've got one, you can hold it up. Hey, great. I had a guy call me this past week um, or send me a note, and he's trying to get his car tuned up, and he is just too lean. Wouldn't run over 2,500 RPM dual carbs, and just ran so poorly. And you know, we're bantering back and forth, and he finally allows that instead of lifting the air piston. A little tiny bit to judge the change in RPM. He's bought the Gunson's color tune. Okay. Well, the color tune's got a nice little chart on it, and they have they they want you to find a blue flame, kind of like your gas range in your kitchen. Our cars will not run with a blue flame. That's way too lean. Our our cars idle rich. So if if you have a color tune and if you're using it, um, why? But if you are, go go for a, a pretty a pretty red flame, a pretty rich flame. That's that's what you're after. Um, I told Heather Rippert that I would make mention tonight about her father's TD. Hank Rippert was a um, uh, long time, long long time MG guy. And he just passed away a couple of months ago, and he had his TD serial number eight 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 eight. And it's all it's all cu highly customized. And he he went to every show around. He used to come to our summer parties. He was always at the um, uh, the all register meets. We've got 129 people now. Um, he was at all the register meets and everything. Great guy, great guy. But he passed away, and his daughter Heather is selling the car. So if anyone's interested, you can drop me a note, or you can probably Google Hank Rippert. TD and find an, an ad advertisement for it. It's uh, the uh, the price is inexpensive, but it's it comes with a lot of a lot of provenance. Um, he was a, a great guy. Hank was real nice guy in the in the MG trade. And I want to say one last thing before we get going, and that's the British Sports Car Hall of Fame. Um, that started off as a project between John Nickus, who was a um, uh, employee. A, a sort of of Moss and Moss Motors, and the Hall of Fame is located within Moss Motors in their uh, Richmond, Virginia uh, warehouse. Anybody when it's open, you can go see it. It's closed right now because of COVID. Um, but if there's anyone who would be interested in in helping out with the Hall of Fame and and doing some legwork or raising some money, hey, get in touch with me. It's uh, it's it's a new a new thing. A, as a precursor to that, um, same guy that, that's uh, involved with the Hall of Fame heavy duty is involved with what's called the Coventry Foundation. And that has to do with the history and technical and tools and so forth for the Jaguar customer uh, cars. Not our cup of tea exactly, but, um, but it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really interesting concept. So 
anyway, that's my notes about that. So I want to get going with um, with the chat. And we've got from Jack Gray. So Jack, you can unmute yourself and I'll read the question here and then we'll talk about it. Valve clearance setting of 22,000s? Question mark. I recently bought a 75B and the previous owner, now deceased, put a label on the engine that says valves inlet 22 exhaust, uh, ex inlet 20 exhaust 22, timing 12 degrees at idle. Well, I don't know if the cam was changed at some point, but that set setting obviously seems excessive. Should I stick with that, or um, or will setting it up mess things mess things up? In other words, moving the the valve clearance back to thirteen. Um, Jack, did you un unmute yourself? Yes, I'm unmuted. Oh, okay, all right. So there's a lot of different cams out there. I made a list of cams one time, MGB cams, and there were like seventy different cams from all these different manufacturers. And some of them want you to set the valves at 13. Some of them want you to set it way up at 22. That's what the cam manufacturer calls for. So your guy must have changed the cam. And therefore he put that information on there. And if the, if the cam supplier says set the valves at this, probably set the valves at that. I'll argue with the timing. Um, and that is that the timing on all of our cars should be 32 degrees before top dead center at full mechanical advance, vacuum disconnected. You take the vacuum advance off, look at the timing with a, with a dial back timing light um, and, and set it at 32 maximum, which means you've revved it up and up and up and the timing moves faster and faster or further and further ahead and then it doesn't move any more ahead because it's at full mechanical advance. That's up around three, 4,000 RPM. So it, it does require a dial back timing light. What, what year is your car? 75, yours doesn't. So follow me through on this, um, and this is for everybody. You know, the timing marks on our cars were put at six o'clock beginning at the MGA. The MGC is up around two o'clock, T-types up around one or two o'clock, you can see those. But all the rest of them, the midgets, the Bs, the As, they were down at six o'clock. You had to crawl on your belly oh, to, mama. To, to get it set up. And it was just, I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna do, Jack, I, I gotta mute. You see mama? I gotta mute everybody and Jack, you can unmute yourself again, so. Um, anyway, um, so when they moved the timing marks up to 11 o'clock in 1972 with the introduction of the 18V engine, you've got five marks. And, and as you come at these um, in a clockwise direction, um, the last mark at the top, can't turn my hand that, that far, at 11 o'clock is zero. So you start at 20, 15, 10, five, and zero. So what I want you to do is put the timing mark down here where you can't see my fingers um, before the timing marks. But how do you estimate 32? And 32 is a real number. It's not 34 and it's not 30, it's 32. It's as close as you can get. Um, so take, take the, to, to do this on a, on a 72 through 80 MGB, you roll, you roll the engine over until the timing mark sits here at 12 degrees before top dead center. Here's 12, 10, five, and zero. Okay, so you take your paint, paint pencil and you make a new mark on the front pulley opposite the zero mark. So the real timing mark is at 12. You paint another mark on your front pulley opposite the zero mark. That mark is now 12 degrees before top dead center. So when you time it with a regular timing light, you wait for the flash to come at the 20 mark with the new, with the new line that you've painted. So you've got 20 plus 12 gives you 32. Well, that's, a, that's a way to do it with a regular timing light that just flashes when the spark comes. So anyway, what kind of cam do you have? I don't know, it's, I've tried in the past, you know, to, to 
to you know put a uh, dial in the a magnetic dial indicator on top of the push rod and turn the engine and try to try to figure out you know what kind of cam it is and you can't all 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 I would suggest you do is go with the the settings that are on there and it really isn't that much noisier than than um a 13 a 13 thousandths sometimes it, it can get rattly and you can pull it down to 13 thousandths if you want it, if it's too noisy. But I'd leave it there where, where your former owner, since you can't ask him, um, where your former owner had it, so. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, okay, all right. All right, so my next one here is, um, oh, from Crystal, Central Texas here. I talked to a guy in, uh, I've got a good friend that lives in Houston, and he said they didn't get one drop of rain from that big storm. We got it up, up here. So, um, Gary Cunningham, I'm gonna mute everybody, mute all, here we go. Okay, Gary, you can unmute yourself. And so, oh, God. Um, hey, okay. So what year model do you have? It's a 60 MGA. Uh, this is a car that you restored Old English White back in 94 and 95. I wasn't the owner at that time. For whom? Mark Panter? Big pardon? For whom? Do you remember the guy's name? I can't recall the, the, the name of the previous owner. Sorry. Well, if, it's okay. <laughs> if we had three or four minutes here and you gave me the VIN, I'd run downstairs in the VIN file and look and see what the whose whose car it was. But anyway, Gary, cool. Gary writes and says he's got an idle speed issue. 750 RPM starting up and idling. But once he's driven for a while, the idle speed increases up to about 1,200. So sure. one reason that it changes so much is because of the mixture. So next time you, you have a chance, you can go out and adjust the mixture on the, on the carburetors. And you can do that with both carburetors still attached to each other. You know, the drafting, <laughs> the, the hiss, that should be the same out of, out of each carburetor. Um, but if you get the air cleaner off, no small task. I've got a hint about that. Let me I have small hands. You need small hands to get those friggin' air cleaners okay. off. Um, um, then you can, you can put the screwdriver down the throat of the carburetor and turn the screwdriver just a touch, just a touch. So the air piston just rises off where it normally is sitting and judge the change in RPM and you're looking for an increase in RPM and then it falls away. If it goes up, 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 which I expect you'll find it'll, it's too rich. If on the other hand, you begin to lift it and the RPM stumbles, immediately falls away, then it's too lean. Okay. Uh, you're looking for an increase of about 50 and that's hard to hear if you've got an old fashioned moving coil uh, um, tachometer you know, with a needle you can see it. it. It'll, you know, you start to you, you start to lift that air piston a little bit, and you watch it jump up 50, 75, 100 RPM, and then fall away again. And then you know that you've got it just perfect. But that's probably my guess. So you don't know, couple, don't separate the two carbs. Uh, no. Keep those connected. Mm -hmm. Unless unless the amount of air that they're drafting is different. Right. right? If one's going, the other one's going. You know, I mean, that's, you know, you, you got to have the same amount of airflow through each carburetor, but that rarely changes over a period of time. Great, great. So, Thank you. I will try that. So here's the trick on the MGA. The MGA air cleaners right now are pancake filters. And I, I've got, a, I've got this pixelation is so weird. So you got these bolts that come in from the outside and bolts that come in from the backside of the carburetor. So the hot setup here is to drill all the way through the can. It's threaded, the, the can itself has, okay. has a tap 5 16 24, fine thread, um, fine, fine thread 5 16 bolts. Drill right through that, drill to the next size larger up from, from 5 16 uh, 21 64 maybe. Mm -hmm. And then use long, long bolts from the front and put them through and buy two of the loops that are used on <clears throat> MGBs. You can put that loop behind the air cleaner, behind the carburetor, and put these long bolts through, 
they tighten up. Oh, it's just a drill. Same, the same setup as an MGB. I, I had a problem doing that in one place on mine, and I had to grind a little tiny bit out of the, one of those loops just for it to clear the backside of my H4 cover because I run a 62 MGA. I had a little problem fitting that, but you know, that's it just, oh my gosh, it just makes a lot of difference. Yeah. It's not original, you know, right. originality guys will kill you, you know, but, but uh, <laughs> hey, not it, next year. <laughs> it's so handy. So anyway, that's it. Also, um, Gary, take a can of spray carburetor cleaner and spray between the head and the manifold, the manifold and the heat shield, the heat shield and the spacer blocks around the, around the throttle shafts and see if you can get the RPM to change. It's not enough to have some leaking around the throttle shifts. I mean, there's always some, you can't, you can't, it's not a perfect seal, but it shouldn't be so much that it grossly, grossly changes the RPM, either speeds it way up or, or right. kills it around the throttle shaft. So. Okay, yep, uh, great. I will try both of those. I, I, you know, I've got, I've got all the files from University Motors, so, um, if you don't have a complete set of files on, on your car uh, from my shop, um, send me the VIN and I'll, I'll, I'll work it backwards and, and we'll, um, we'll see what we can do. But there was, there's also an accompanying via, uh, video, VHS video that I have of that restoration. So used to, we used sure. to, used to, to do before cell phones, we used to do that. I had the, I had the shoulder mount camera and I'd go out and put, put that on and, and we'd shoot and then, and then the clip and I, yeah, I've got, I've got the masters of most of those, but you know, there's you know, like old film that yeah. begins to go red, old VHS tapes start to get some wonky stuff in them too. But anyway, great. Well, then you get to see me when I was younger, although I, I did, yes. <laughs> I'm often behind the camera. So it's, uh, but you get to see my, my guys. Well, anyway, hey, thanks a lot, Gary. Where, no problem. Thank you, John. Where are you calling from? Brighton, Michigan. Right, okay, right. Okay. Okie doke. All right, I'm going to mute everybody. Here we go. Everyone's muted, and we're going to the next one. And uh, Oscar is just uh, weighing in here. Uh, Oscar Petrie from Ocala, Florida. That's uh, home of the Ocala. That's where the uh, Lowell Instant uh, Prison is. Yeah, how would I know that? Um, so anyway, hello, Oscar. Now from Jeff to everyone. Hi, John. Really appreciate you doing these seminars. I'm doing a body off restoration on an MGA. I have completed the framework and I'm close to putting the body back on. Stop. Don't. But we'll get there. My next step is wiring. I'm looking for guidance on the first steps to do the wiring right to get it prepared and installed on the frame before I put the body back on. Well, the first thing that, uh, you can unmute yourself, please. Um, I'm here. Uh, Jeff, okay, all right. Where, where are you calling from, Jeff? Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, all right. So do you have the factory parts manual for your MGA? Yes. Factory parts manual? Yes. Okay, all right, so that explains so much just by looking at, at the pictures. Who else has got um, Bob Vitricus? Yeah, that was one of the first books out um, about restoration, but it really doesn't have a lot to do about restoration. Um, Barney Gaylord has a great site, you know, mgaguru.com. And there's a lot of, a lot of information there. You, you, sometimes you got to wade through a bunch of other stuff to find what you're, what you're looking for specifically. But the, the wiring on the right, on the, on the frame just runs underneath, you know, it's, it's held in those little um, 90 degree straps um, that are attached to, to the frame and then the cables are all carried above it. And that's the, the fuel, the fuel, the wiring, the main battery cable. One of those doesn't go in there. One, there's, cause there's four cables that go, go to the back. Your brake lights, your fuel, uh, not brake lights, your, your, your wiring loom, your brakes, gasoline, and main battery cable. So you got four things there. One of them, I think the one or two of them are attached in those little uh, squeezy things, the metal that's, that's bent over. Um, 
anyway, somebody else here on the board is probably um, working on this. I don't have any pictures that are handy of the way that it goes. Um, I do have a friend who's doing that right now. I don't know if he's doing it right or not, um, but I can put you in touch with him if you want to send me an, an email later and I'll just put you, you two guys in contact. So anyway, okay. when you do an MGA restoration, uh, like a, a frame off restoration, it's like you take the body off. You don't take the frame. Why do they call the frame off? Anyway, um, after the body's off and you send the body away to the, to the body shop, to get that done, which is always a much larger task than the body shop ever imagined, unless they've done one before. And then they start squealing part way in that they haven't bid it high enough, and they haven't, you know, it's just, anyway, it's a huge project, not one straight line in that body. Anyway, um, you build up the chassis, gas tank, batteries, um, steering wheel, you can fit the brake master and clutch master cylinder box in place. Um, engine, gearbox, suspension, uh, zip tie the, the, uh, the radiator in somehow, go out and drive the car, start it up and go out and drive it. It just, it's, a, um, it's usually a, a real morale boosting step. You go, yes, it works. And if you buggered up the second gear synchro in the, in the gearbox or something, it shows up now and you don't have to take it, you know, out of a beautiful body because once the car is done, the first time you take it apart, it it never looks it never looks as good as it does when it first comes out. You know, it just doesn't. So um, so you, you can get some of the mechanical problems there if you do have any. Then put that under under a sheet. You've got the you got the body up on sawhorses, and you put the dash in. You put the windscreen in. You put the roof fenders on. Uh, you can put some of the interior in. You get the heater box in place. You can't put the brake master cylinder in place because that that has to go on afterwards. You get the, the the wiper, you know, the wipers and all that kind of stuff. You can get the front fenders on. And then this thing's sitting on, on jack stands. And then you get like 80 of your good friends to come over and you pick the thing up, you know, and walk it straight o over the over the frame and drop the frame on. So the only things you can't have in place are the radiator the air cleaners on the engine. It's, it's often difficult if you've got the starter switch in place. It's, it's just a bugger getting around that. Um, that's about it. I mean, you, you, you get the floorboards already in the frame and everything. So it just, it makes it so nice. Otherwise, gas tank, gas tank. Gas tank, yes. Yep, yep, that fits right, right over. Otherwise you're, you know. No, it doesn't. It doesn't on mine, John. It should. I have to it should. You know, the last time we did want one of these, it fit right on. It's like, wait, I thought the gas tank didn't fit because that gas tank hole is about this. It's huge. It's huge. It's got that plate that go, goes around it. So, all right. So who's that, Wayne? Is that Rich? Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. So anyway, so Jeff, apparently there's there's a there can be an issue with um, with the gas tank, but Besides that, besides that, so somebody's phone's ringing. Um, so in, anyway, um, and I was going to put you in touch with Rich, who j w weighed in about the about the gas tank because he's he's redoing his frame right right now. So send me a note later, and, and we'll see if we can get that. But there's a there's um I think a Malcolm Green book about building MGAs. Yeah, I've got that one. A lot of factory <laughs> pictures, and you know, you look at that, and you go, oh, that's already done before they put the body on, right? It just it gives you uh, uh, an assembly um, plant sequence, sort of. You know, so. All right, great. Thank hey, you. I wish I could be more more specific, but yeah, okay. I'm going to mute everybody here. So nice to talk to you, Jeff. And we're going to go down to Greg uh, Swartley. John, I got my MGB running last week. Thanks again for helping me. It smoked a ton, and I think and I think uh, I need to do something with the rings. Okay, Greg, you can unmute yourself. Where's Greg? I'm here, John. Okay, all right. So, what what year and model is this? It's a '68 MGB. Four weeks ago, you told me to how to break the engine free, 
Uh, I got it running about a week ago, drove it around in the yard, and I was li I was smoking out all the all the uh, bugs. <laughs> well, you got to put you re and and you're consuming a, a, a quart every ten miles at that. I mean, it's your your oil consumption is severe, so you got to be cautious when you go out, but. If you got brakes and you you got a license plate here in Michigan, we don't we don't we can drive on old plates yet because the Secretary of State isn't set up yet to accept our money uh, to get new registrations. But anyway, you've got to go out and put it on the road. I mean, yeah, you're probably going to have to change the rings. But what if you went out and drove it on the road and it sort of wore itself in, you know, and the rings kind of loosened up and stuff, and you don't have to go in and change the rings. You know, how nice would that be? You know, I mean, just it's, you always do the cheapest, easiest, simplest stuff first. So, so put some miles on it. I mean, high speed miles, I mean, 60 miles an hour. And just, you know, you'll, you'll find a take, carry a set of plugs in case the plugs fall out. I need to carry a lot of oil and uh, just, just start to make larger concentric circles around your house until you trust it. And, and uh, just, just run it, run it hard for a couple hundred miles, literally. It's cheaper to do that in an afternoon than it is to take the engine apart. Now that said, if you want to take the engine apart, easy. It's uh, you can take the head off with a manifolding on it. That's just a terror. A lot, a whole lot better to take the manifolding off, drain the coolant, take the head off, take the sump off. You can do that in place, and then you can push all four pistons out the top, no problem. Uh, then you've got you should remove the ridge in the cylinder. Uh, in the cylinders, and then you've got to get a honing stone. Uh, it's a 3.164, a 3 so you're going to get like a three and a quarter inch uh, honing stone and and hone the cylinders. It's a project, um, but you can do it, um, and um, you can do it in place all the time. You've got the crankshaft covered with some rags, so whatever falls down in there doesn't scar up the, the journals. And then you buy new good rings, Devis, D-E-V-E-S, Grant, G-R-A-N-T, or Hastings, piston rings, except no substitutes. And, uh, you, you know, you'll, you'll see when you, when you take the head off what size the pistons are. And, you know, right now you'd say, well, they're probably standard, but you just don't, they might be 60s. Who knows what's in there? Um, so you do that, and then you put those rings in, new rod bearings, um, what year is this? 68. 68? Yes. So you got, you got five main bearings. So you're going to buy a main bearing uh, kit um, for, for the bearings and change three of the five main bearings and put new oil pump in it. Now you've got three of the five main bearings. You can't get the, the, the front or rear bearing off without taking the engine out of the car. Um, you got four new ride bearings, you got new, new rings, new oil pump, you're gonna get great oil pressure, although you won't know because the 68's got an electric oil pressure gauge. And those, I don't wanna say those never read accurately, so I'll just say they almost never read accurately. The hot setup on 68, 68 through 70 is to remove the electric oil pressure sending unit and get um, a real one from a 72 through 76, Paul Deershaw, I, his name comes up every week, but he's, he's the great guy. You need the, the intermediate piece and a capillary, capillary line and the, and the gauge. You gotta drop the steering column out to reach up and behind there. It's a real, it'll task you. It's as difficult to do as changing the rings. Um, simpler it seems, but you just, you can't reach it. You know, it's just gotta, have, you just gotta go at it so carefully. Anyway, then you get a proper oil pressure gauge reading, oil pressure reading. So anyway, you can do that in place, but I'd go out and drive that car first and, and just press it, you know, press it, who knows, you know? So, okay. I mean, doesn't cost much. So, and worse come to worse, worse come to worse, bearing fails or something, ah, you're gonna have to go through the engine anyway, you know, so. I was kind of thinking I wanted to because a friend of mine and myself want to drive across the country next year and put about 7,000 miles on some old MGBs. Then you probably want to take the engine out and, and go through it. But remember that figure that I, that I threw out before, the $1,000 a cylinder? 
So if you're doing the work yourself, you can email me. I'll send you all the information I've got about rebuilding the engine. You got to have a really good engine shop. You know, they can do all the right stuff to, to the engine. And you can put it together. It's just being careful and clean. And there's some videos out, Dr. Doolin's how to re, you know, I watched that once. The guy's working on a dirt floor, but the engine worked at, at the end. So um, uh, there's a lot of information out there about building the engines. So if you're gonna, if you're anticipating doing that, yeah. We have a, we have a pretty good shop up in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania okay. here that I know have, uh, they've done uh, British cars before. I have some friends that had motors rebuilt there and worked on okay. it. Okay. You can abandon the whole, the whole engine to the machine shop too, and just drop the engine off and come back and write them a check. You don't have to, you know, it just, there's lots and lots of di different ways to do I, it. I'm not quite that person. I, I, okay. I'd like to have them do some work, but I, I yeah. like to do as much as I can. Okay. All right, and the trick is always on a rebuilt engine or an engine that hasn't run forever is get oil pressure before you start it. You take the spark plugs out, spin it, and, and, and uh, until you get oil pressure. Then you put the plugs in and start it up. Yeah, I was, I was real happy when this motor fired up because it, I don't know when it ran last, but it was locked up pretty solid. It was, it was nice when it fired up. I, I have never failed to thaw out an engine. I've always been able to get them loose. So now that I've never tried to get one loose that's been out, out in a field with the cylinder head off and the water standing in the cylinders. No, not that. But my friend who, who has got this MGC that hasn't run for 25 years, you know, that's, oh my gosh, what a project that would be to go through that engine. So I said, you know, just take the plugs out, put the, put the penetrant in there and go for it. So well, I'm, I'm glad. Okay. I'm glad that, that that worked out okay. So, yeah, I I did have the head off. Uh, I don't know if you remember four weeks ago. I had the head off, and uh, cylinder three had a good bit of rust in it that I actually cleaned out with a vacuum. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, okay. Okay. So that 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 cylinder worries me a little bit. I I believe that's the one that's smoking. Yeah, pro probably. So, but if you're going to do th that kind of mileage. Um, you probably want to go through the whole engine, but you no, know, only takes an afternoon to go out and put a couple hundred miles on it. So, okay. all, right. all right, Greg, thank you very much. I'm going to mute everybody again, and we're going to, we've got 150 people on right now from all over. Uh, iPad 2, uh, hi, John, thanks for all you do. Uh, Andy, does anyone know how to get the sound working? Okay, so um, people who are more skilled with this uh, than I am can unmute yourself, and I, maybe Andy already has the sound working. But when you, well, I've got a, I've got a laptop, and when I put my cursor on the bottom of the screen, there's a ribbon that shows up, and way over on the left is a mute, um, and and that turns you on and off. And then the sound ought to be working. Apparently, people can hear me. So maybe it's just your computer and you've got it muted. I don't know. You still having a problem, Andy? Of course, if it's muted, if, if you can't hear me, you don't know I'm talking to you. And maybe you already hung up. So anyway, OK, well, we're going to go on to Greg Perigo, John, 1964, Alva Courier with an MGA drivetrain. So the car's got 35,000 miles on it hasn't been started since 1983. The engine turns, the carbs have oil, the transmission shifts. What tips do you have to make it run again? So that's, we're going back to, to the same thing, get everything else sorted out, get the, get, the, uh, get the brakes sorted out and the electric sorted out so you can go out and drive it. Because if you get the engine sorted out first, you're gonna say, oh, I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna drive it around the block, and the handbrake kind of works, you know. And you're just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna go around the block. It's like, dude, that's like way too dangerous. Get the brakes. The brakes are gonna have to be done I anyway. So then, um, with um, you know, if the engine spins over, you probably are gonna have to clean up the distributor. The points are either silver or tungsten, and they corrode. 
silver points corrode. So you take the distributor out and service that, just make sure that's okay. The carburetors have all dried up, rebuild those, put some fresh gas in it, get oil pressure, start it up, see what you got. So Greg, you there? Or did you un unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm here, John. Okay, all right. So yeah, hey, how cool is that? So so um, Elva Couriers were race cars, that's my understanding, although I saw one in California a couple of years ago that, that had not been used for racing. It had been used for just a, a, a drive-around car, and it wasn't all hacked up like most of them are. So, yeah, yeah. yeah so anyway, some, it's great. That, that ought to help you out a little bit. I appreciate it. Oak and Oak. All right. Greg, thank you. And you're from, um, you're calling from Fort Wayne? Correct. All right. Okay. So I see Dave, Dave Kelp. He's from Fort Wayne, too. Yeah. I'm going to mute everybody, and we're going on to Paul. Paul, on a 1977 MGB, do the standard and overdrive gearboxes share the same rear seal? Remember the rule. If the part can possibly be the same, it's not. So the answer is no. Uh, no, the, the seals are altogether different between the standard gearbox and the overdrive gearbox. So you're gonna to have to get a, a proper seal for your overdrive gearbox if that's if that's what you're going for. So where's Paul? Did you unmute yourself, Paul? You can. Let me find out where where, where you're from. I'm looking at my screen, but but you're not either either you're not fast on the button or I can't hear you or something. So we're gonna pass on Paul. And now we got uh, Darren Scarlett from the UK. Oh, to get sound, go to the unmute button, click on the up arrow, and have a look at the audio settings. So that's from Darren to our, uh, our guy before from Andy about getting the sound working. So Darren, thank you very kindly. So, all right, here we go from Walter. Uh, Walter, you can uh, about your Robin's top on your MGB. I put a new Robin Stay Fast top on my MGB last week with a later top frame with a zip out rear window. Now I have severe buffeting when I drive over 50 miles an hour with the, with the uh, door windows down and the rear window zipped up. It goes away with the door glass or the zip out window down. Have you ever come across this? We used to call it at the shop, we called it the Han Flutter, H-A-H-N. He was a customer of mine. And we put a new soft top on his midget and it always just bounced. It's 60 miles an hour, it just went zzzz and it bounced up, up and down. And the reason it bounces is because the top's not tight enough. Now the problem you got now is you've already got it on. And it's already glued into place. And you're gonna say, ah, it's just as tight as I can get it. Um, but, um, it's going to be all but impossible to remove it from the header rail now and get it tighter. So now the trick is to, is to press up on the, the uh, soft top. And I have seen people take a towel, nice towel from your kitchen when your wife isn't home, she won't miss it, and wrap it around or something like that, wrap it around the um, um, top bows, and that'll stretch the top a little bit and cut down on that fluttering. That's that's what I, I assume that, that you're talking about, Walter. Is that correct? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I lost you for a minute there. I turned on my audio and I lost the call. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, well, geez. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. So the top's too loose. That's what the problem. That's what the problem no, is. No, the top. The top is not loose. It's um. It's as it's, tight as you can get it. It's pretty, it's fairly tight. I can barely, you know, attach the front. Um, okay. Well, when it was new, I could barely attach the front. Now it's, it's, it's loosened up a little bit. It's a stay fast top. Um, yeah. I, I've done lots of tops in the past. Um, oh, okay. All this, right. This is my first stainless, uh, first uh, cloth top. And um, it's my own car. And uh, I was a former BMC tech in the old days, or at least a Leyland tech. Okay. Uh, the, um, Top looks and fits great, um, but the buffeting is unbelievable. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's, you, you know that when you put your, your fist, your hand up against the top, 
and stretch it, it quits. Um, so that's that's when it's tighter. It, it it quits making that noise. So you know that it's too loose. I, I know it doesn't seem like it's very much too loose, but that's got to be it. The MGA um, had a, the the center bar on the MGA on the original ones went through an extra loop in the top, and it held it down and it kept it from fluttering. Um, yeah. Um, but of course, these don't have that provision unless you're really, really good with, with uh, upholstery and you dare take the top and top frame off and mark it and, and glue, um, you know, a, a, a piece. God, it's just, this pixelation is tough. It glue a piece on the underside against the top and will it stay there? You know, will it stay there or will it rip off with, with the, the vibration that's always going on? So um, we used to get I'll, so tight that you know you really you had to put your body on that on that front on that front uh, bar um, to to get it to latch. Well, my fear when I when I assembled it, it was is that it was too tight because it was you can drum on it, um, but that's loosened up a little bit with you know with a little bit of time in the sun. Yeah. But um, I think the the fabric is thinner. Um, okay. And I think that's causing the problem. Um, I love the way the top looks on the car, but it's almost undrivable at speed. Uh, I'll try the towel on the, on the center bar and see that. Oh, helps. That's, that that solves it right, right there. You know, but it looks kind of weird when when you're driving. Like there's an extra extra little uh, yeah uh, peak on on it there, and it, it's not consistent. But you know. Just, just, just as an, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just as an aside, I did contact Robbins Tops, and I actually spoke to with Doug Robbins. Um, okay. And they said they'll get back to me if I get any other information. I will uh, feed it back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, I remind everybody that I'm a, I'm like a funnel of, of for information. People tell me stuff, and I, and I, I have all the stuff. I've, I've never fit a top myself ever, but I've seen it done a hundred times in my shop a hundred times. So I, I know the techniques and, and so forth, but I've never done it myself. So there's a lot of stuff I haven't done or I, and when I come up with an idea, it seems like it comes from me, but it really comes, you know, through the, through the grapevine, you know, somebody else has, has told me, um, you know, like the little tiny alignment holes that was, 40 years ago, probably, but when I worked in, in the UK, it, the original University Motors, somebody said, well, yeah, mate, that's what them two little holes are, well, they probably wouldn't have said them, that's what those two two little holes are for in the in the hinges on the on the bonnet, is so you can get the bonnet back back in place again. So I, I, I might have discovered that later on, wondering what those were for, but somebody told me, so but I did have an MGA which, which had an original top and it had that extra, it had that extra um, um, hole in it that a, that a, a piece of the uh, top bowl went through. And now those are great, you know, so. Yeah, I don't think, uh, I think it would probably show through on the top because it's uh, yeah. pretty thin yeah. material. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, whatever you find out from Robbins, pa pass along, send me an email or something. and. And I'll, I'll try to remember to, to pass that information on to everybody else. But the bottom line is, yes, I have seen that <laughs> on, on, the, okay. on plastic tops. God, I went to um, Carlisle. You know, they have a big import car show uh, every year. It isn't as big as it used to be. But um, I went there one time, and a guy, I was walking, looking at one vehicle after another. And here's a, here's a it looks like a TR6 is really a TR5, TR250. And the top looked like it had been poured on the place, in the place. It was just perfect. And I, I went over to the guy and I said, how in the world did you get the top fitted so well on this? And he says, well, I pulled it as tight as it would go and clamped it down and put it out in the sun. And that night, he says, when it was all loose, I pulled it tight again and clamped it down and put it out in the sun the next day. And he, he did that like seven times. And this thing wow. was just beautiful. You can't do that on a customer car. Um, unless you're going to charge them yeah. $600 for installation. But 
Um, yeah, it was just, it was really, really, but that was a plastic top. So it stretched and it stretched and contracted. And that's the thing with the fabric is it doesn't, it doesn't contract like the, like the plastic ones do. Right. Just as an aside, the top I replaced was an actual factory top from 1980. With a diamond pattern on the inside. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, hey, where, where are you calling from, Walter? Um, it's Canyon Country, California, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. Okay. My daughter's moving out to Los Angeles around the, around the 1st of November, and I'm prepping a uh, 73 BGT for her to use as primary transportation. So awesome. I, I need, I'm, I'm going to need the name of the uh, good repair shops uh, out there so I don't have to fly out every time she calls. So where, I, is she gonna, where is she going to live in Los Angeles? Uh, east, east Los Angeles. I can't think of the name of the su suburb. East. She's she's in the movie biz, you know, that the magnet's on out there. So it, it attracts all the people that are, are involved with the She's in production and stuff. So, so Okay. Uh, send me a note, Walter. Okay. Thank you. Much. All right. Thank you. If All she right. needs any help, contact me. Hey, thank you very much. All right. Um, gonna, thank you. Bye. Okay. I'm going to mute everybody. And, and uh, here we go. And we're going on to our next one from Andrew Sloman. Without spending a ton of money like Snap-on, what's a good brand of dial back timing light? I have an ancient timing light that I haven't used in years and I'm thinking of buying one. So Andrew, you can unmute yourself. Um, you know, the, right. the, the head of the uh, MG Car Club England is also named Sloman. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's hired staff. I, I mean, I expect he drives an MG, but he's the, he's the uh, executive guy there. His name is Sloman. So what- Yeah, my, my, I know my, my grandfather, my dad's dad was born in England, but raised in Canada okay. and, and came to the States during the depression. So we're originally English. <laughs> okay. That's a, yeah. Most of us are here. Yeah, yeah. I, I expect, you know, some, some part of us it, anyway. Yeah. So what year do you have? What year? Uh, I've got a, I've got a 74 that I'm driving and I've got a, I've got a 67 that's sitting. I'm slowly starting to gather parts. I've had it since 1985. Oh my um, gosh. Okay. And, and I never heard of, I, I had used that, like all the cars now, I just take it to get them to my newer sure. cars. I just take them in, but, okay. um, so I'd never heard of the, the dial back timing light. I mean, until a few years ago and never heard the 32 degrees. So I don't think I ever timed that car right when I, when I worked on it. Well, and, you know, there's, there's an advanced curve, right? I mean, and it's not a curve there. It's not a curve at all. It's a, it, it's linear. It's just, it, it's the faster it goes, the more advanced you get. You got two different springs in the distributor usually one real, real lightweight one that works up to about idle and then another one that takes off and works it the rest of the way. And um, um, over a period of time, those springs get weak. So when the factory says time it at 14 degrees at 1200 RPM or something like that, that presupposes that the distributor is working perfectly. But usually over a period of time, the distributor the springs fail, they get weak, and so it over advances. So you set it at, at 14 at, at 1200 RPM, and then when you're running flat out, it's only getting up to 28 degrees because it was already advanced a little too much to begin with um, inside the distributor. So the, the way to make sure that the timing is correct at high speed, and that's where you need it to be correct. When you're running down the road at 60 miles an hour, um, you know, you're, that's, that's where it's got to be the best. Um, that's where your damage is going to occur at, at higher speed when the engine's being asked to put out that kind of power. So 32 degrees is it, 1945 through 1980, except twin cams. They got a different cylinder head. All of it, TCs, TDs, midget 1500s, A's, MG 1100s, MGCs, they're all 32 degrees, full mechanical advance, vacuum disconnected. Now on your 74, you've got those five timing marks that you come around to. And I already explained, you, you heard the explanation about- I, I, I did. Okay, if you get, if you go, what in the world did he say, call me tomorrow or text me or send me a note and I'll, I'll explain it again. 
So the other way that you can do timing is static timing. Now each, each distributor advances a, at a different rate and for a different total number of degrees. But once you get back to 1967, you've got the original best distributor that was fitted to an MGB, 40897. That one has um, 10 degrees of distributor advance, which is 20 degrees on the crankshaft. So if you static time it at 12 degrees, 12 plus 20 equals 32. So you don't have to have the engine running there. You can do it with a test light. You can't static time with electronic ignition. Some people say, oh, sure you can, just do this, but it's like, it's real dicey. But if you got, if you got a point, you're home free. Yeah. So, okay, right. Oh, what kind is the best kind? You go to the auto parts store, you buy one, it'll last for a year, mind you. They don't like, they, they don't like um, uh, straight wire. They like re re resistor wire. All of our, almost all of our cars have got resistor wire, but if you get a straight wire, like on an A or a, or a, a T type, very often the, the uh, timing lights won't work because they, they need a, a spike in the, in the voltage to, to make them flash. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not even buying cheap tools, so I just thought. <laughs> you know, you're only going to use it now, now and then. You know. Yeah, I know that's that's the thing. That's that's why I don't really want to buy like a Snap-on or a Matco or a, a real high-end one. But at the same time, I don't want to buy a cheap cheapy. Yeah. So, and it seems like most most of the auto parts stores anymore are carrying cheap El Cheapo tools, even Napa, anymore. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and last last. <laughs> Last week I said it's only we only have ourselves to blame because yeah. everyone shops by price. If if uh, Pet Boys has got a timing light for 150 and Napa's got it for 99, where are you going to buy it? You know, <laughs> so, yeah. so it's the, the the game is on to make it as cheaply as you possibly can. And when there are no rules confines about how long it's supposed to last, or maybe even how accurate it's supposed to be, I suppose they're accurate, you know, because they're printed circuits and stuff but um, mm -hmm. I had an old one with it had had the vacuum tubes in it the first one that I ever had I God knows how, how, how that worked but that was in England so anyway that that's my scoop I, I bought one in uh, Los Angeles in uh, San Diego because I was out there was that four years ago for the MGB event in San Diego and I, I bought one maybe I, I bought it in Solvang um, up around there for the MGA meet. But um, anyway, I said, I need a dial back timing light. And the, you know, the 18 year old guy kind of looks at me and, and I said, it's hanging right there. And he turns around and of course there's a quarter inch of dust on it. And he goes, oh man, it's been a long time since I sold one of these. But yeah, and it lasted about a year so. But I use mine more than you, you'll use yours. Yeah. Okay. All right, th thank you. Hey, you're very welcome. I'm going to mute everybody and then I'm going to make my unabashed because it's 8.02. I'm going to make my unabashed pitch for hitting the PayPal button. Go to my website. Um, behind me, it's, uh, it says University Motors. Um, it says online, but, but if you go to universitymotorsltd.com um, and then there's a PayPal button, that's really kind. I, I will, I, I'll even read your name, you know, next week, next time we have the session. First and third Third, um, Tuesdays of the month. So uh, anyway, I, I appreciate the contributions and it helps me offset the, the real expenses that I incur uh, doing all, all this. And you know, if you've talked to me before um, on the phone, uh, I'm always available on the phone to answer questions. If you've written me and I, and I have written you back, uh, I'm not like Ann Landers. I, I do not, I have not answered every every letter that I get on email, I apologize. So if you really need to know it, call me, you know, but I'm, I'm there, I'm, I love to help, help you out. So, and that's uh, pushing that PayPal button helps me out a little bit. So anyway, now we got uh, Severio. Hey John, John, before you leave timing. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I talked to your buddy Rob in New Hampshire and did send my distributor to him. But he kind of put the fear of Jesus in me and told me that, uh, you know, it's probably nowhere near accurate because none of them are near accurate. So I wonder, well, I've been timing all these years if, uh, if that's the case. He says the precision on those things 
out of the factory was horrid. If the car's oh. running well, what do you do? Don't know. If you got points, you static time it. You know, so. Okay. So I, I don't, I don't know. I hate to hear that, but um, you know, it's probably true. I, I've got a snap-on timing light that I was using, and then that quit. So no, I, not the light. The distributor itself. Oh, the old, the old distributors are all over. They're horrid. They're all over, the, and the new ones are worse. The new ones that are made in China that you buy, you buy those are, those are awful. So that's both, uh, okay, both the um, the distributors, uh, both the distributor rebuilders, Jeff Schlemmer in Minnesota, Advanced Distributor, and um, Rob Medinsky in New Hampshire at British Vacuum Unit can do wonders with your distributors, and it's it really. I mean, I, I go back to. You know the engine. The engine is huge, right? I mean, the engine's engine is huge, and and that's one system. And then you've got the carburetors, and those are du double the size of your fists. I mean, I mean that's one car. If you run into carburetors, one carburetor's um, at least as big as both of your fists. But the distributor, which makes the spark, times the spark, and distributes the spark, the nervous system of the car, that's only as big as your as your fist. And it does a lot of stuff in there, and most carburetor problems are, are timing problems. So get your distributor rebuilt. That is so critical. Oh, speaking of rebuilders, I talked to Peter at um, Nicinger Instruments. I had a, I had a question from, from my Toronto group last week, Tuesday, the private uh, club group, and someone said, what do you lube a new Speedo cable with? And I, I offhand, I was going to say nothing, but I talked to Peter and he said, new or old, if you want to be really good fitting a new Speedo cable, take the, take the inner cable out, out of the sheath, wipe it off because it's full of dirt and crap from shipping and, and little bits of styrofoam and God knows what. And then take a rifle cleaning brush, if you have one, um, and clean out the sheath, get that all nice, and then wipe the thinnest film you can of Lubra plate, that's a trade name, or white grease, number two, lithium grease. I'm gonna mute everybody because I got some, some background noise here. Um, so um, Lubra plate, it's a white, white grease and the thinnest film you can put on there. You get too much grease on there and it, and it screws up the cable, gets in the back of the Speedo, Speedo quits working. And now there's like two, two big places left in the United States to have your, your gauges rebuilt. One is Nicinger Instruments in Maranek, New York, and the other one is uh, Morris at West Valley Instruments in what, I don't know, San Francisco, someplace in California. Uh, Margaret used to do it out of MoMA, she's passed away. There's someone else there. Oh, but they don't do the volume of work that Margaret used to do, I guess. Um, you mean there's no, um, there's no sound to John Twist. What's that? Got any ideas? At first, this. So I'm going to mute everybody here so that. Okay, so it should be. Dave, Dave, oh. Dave Kirchival, you keep yeah. un unmuting oh. yourself here. Trying to get your your voice to work, but I, I I'm going to mute you again. Um, there we go. Okay, Dave's Dave from Indianapolis. So, all right, and uh, Severio, where, where where are you from? I'm uh, from Toronto, from yeah. Toronto, Canada. I missed the session last week, and I'm glad you're having the session this week. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So now we have. Um, oh, we, and and then here we go. He's on again. All right, I need a new brake servo for my 78B. It's been on back order for some time. Are they hard to come by? I may have access to a rebuild kit. Is, is it difficult to rebuild the, the servo on a 78B? No, it's really, really easy. Um, it really is if you get the, the rebuild kit. It comes with a diaphragm, which is, you know, is big around, but those are hardly ever bad. The critical point here, the critical point is how far the push rod sticks out of the front of the servo or it goes into the brake master cylinder. I think that's 0 0.470 inches. I just have that in my head. No, 0 0.407 inches. Like, what's that? What kind of, is that? Yeah, what kind of number is that? 
it's maybe it's a fractional move, moved over to metric. But if you got it, your, your workshop manual, it shows you that. I had some little tools made. I made some little nuts that were just 0. 0.407 inches tall. And I had a little strap that went between them. So you could adjust that push rod. That's the critical point there. Getting it on and off the What's car is problem? just a terror. Yours hisses? Is that the problem? Is yours hisses? Yeah, it, it hisses. I still get some power assist, so I haven't disconnected yeah. it because I, I yeah. spoke about this last time. Um, but I still yeah. get some power assist, so that's that's good. Okay, and well, there's, um, I, you know, you, you guys order from England all the time, right? I mean, it, it ought to be somebody in England ought to have it, Brown and Gammons, or of course, they didn't have that system on the on the British cars, but there's one place. And then I, I keep going back to Paul Deershaw, it's Sports Car Craftsman in Arvada, uh, Colorado. He's he's a really great resource for used parts. You know, I mean, there's a new new parts. There's all kinds of people that, that have the stuff. But if, if you can't get it, that means that it's not in the system right now. So yeah. maybe a good used one is better than a than the one that you've got. So well, I, the, uh, yeah, the new the new one that they're advertising on Moss looks like it's an aftermarket. Um, so, because I've got the shop manual, and it says to use these tools or that tool. It's not difficult to open up the canister. And um, I made I two. I made two straps. Again, it's hard for me to gesture, but I made two foot-long straps that I drilled, and 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 you you um, you put those in the in the uh, on the back of the servo and, and unscrew the can. So okay, so a serpentine belt would work on that as well too. Then maybe maybe could yeah. sure. Okay. Okay, Oak. I wish I had better luck there. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Okay. So I'm going to mute everybody again. And I started to talk about fractional uh, versus metric. Little did I know, but my daughter, who holds a, 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 my other daughter, who holds a doctorate in chemistry, sent me an article she thought I'd like to see. And little did I know that there were two feet foot measurements in simultaneous use in the United States. Now, one of them's just getting phased out because one guy went on a personal campaign to get rid of it, but it has to do for land measure. And the two feet are different, something like they're two feet, the, 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 the distance is, is two feet different over, over like 100 miles or over 1,000 miles. It's the, the, for any of us, the two individual feet used in the United States are, are, are all but the same, but they're not. They're not. How fascinating is that? I had no idea that we had two feet, but I don't do much land surveying. So that's, that's where that, that, that foot that they're getting rid of comes from. So, okay. Anyway, that was just an aside. Here we go from Michael to everyone about, about his uh, MGA starter switch. You can unmute yourself, Michael. Uh, I'm here. Right and says, I've been, having, I've been having trouble with the starter switch and the starter on my 57 MGA. Um, and so, you know, the first thing to do is diagnose it and, and you can use a pair of jumper cables and jump around that switch, you know, and, and whenever I do that, and I'm testing the starter motor, I always test it 20 times. I mean, I, you could test it 50, but five isn't enough. Um, you can have a you can have a problem or a dead spot in the uh, in the starter motor, but if you jump around uh, and you know hit, hit, you can't lay something against both posts because the middle post is higher, so you short against it and ruin the switch. But the new switches aren't aren't um, aren't as good as the original switches were. You know, we had one guy, Greg Purvis, who would open up the old switches, peel them apart. It took forever. <laughs> took forever peel them open, you know, clean everything on the inside, put them back together. They work great. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the, you know, I, I've had the original, when I replaced the switch, it lasted four years. Then the second one was bad out of the box and they stick, uh, you know, on, which is not a good thing. And the third one lasted two weeks. And, and now I found, and they're all the plastic back ones, I believe from China. The, I found some ones in England that are all metal like the original. And the guy says they're Lucas OE spec. And I'm just curious if you ever heard of those or any place here to buy them in the US because shipping is a killer to get, get one from uh, 
uh, England and whether they really are OEAE spec? Well, I don't know if he says they are. It's it's pretty easy to tell. They got a a build date on them and, and a part number. But um, the, the that's the problem with the the, the new switches is they fuse. They right. fuse together with that current that's going through there. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, do you have your old switch around? No, that that okay. died. So, and that guy says the, I don't really want to go to a plastic one. I found a, a plastic, uh, one with a white plastic back, a tan plastic black and a, and a, a back and a black plastic back. And then these ones from England, I have metal, pl metal backs yeah. with the rubber bushing yeah. like the original. Yeah, that, that sounds, no, yeah get one of those i mean even if you have to pay 100 bucks for it what's that compared to the starter motor sticking on right well that's and that that leads and that's what i just was curious if you knew anybody in the u.s that uh, sold those metal ones from england and if no. they were okay so the second question is while diagnosing this i pulled the starter on you know i have to do it under the hood because so i can manually push it back after it sticks right yeah uh, and the engine started right up, but the Bendix did not uh, release. So, and you know, I tried it a couple times and it just kept, it was stuck. So I had to pull the starter out and I inspected it, everything looked good, put it back together and, and then it released, you know, it, it works normally. Have you ever heard of the starter Bendix just staying engaged, which is obviously not a good thing. Um, no, not a good thing at all. That poor little starter motor is going to be whipping around there at fifty thousand RPM or something, and the and the armature just blows up. I've got yeah. I've got MGB ones that have exploded. Um, um, no, so you can take the, take it out. Um, most of the most you know the original early starter motors had a nut on the end with a split pin through it. You could unscrew that and take all the individual components from the Bendix out, clean them, you know, there's a burr on something apparently. Uh, it, it could be that there's a burr on your flywheel and that's what's keeping the Bendix uh, stuck in there. Yeah, uh, but once a, once I, I, you know, turned it off, turned it back on, turned it off, it was stuck, completely stuck. So if it was a burr on one of the, on the flywheel, it should have released itself once it got off that burr unless the yeah. whole, yeah. The whole thing was burnt. And I did have a problem where the, the new starter switch, you know, I started it and it, it started buzzing and I go, oh, crap. And I jumped up you know, <laughs> opened the hood to manually release oh. it, right? So, but I, you know, when I had the starter out, I inspected the flywheel and it didn't look like it was ground away. And the Bendix didn't look like it was ground away. So, you know, maybe it was just a one off thing. But uh, you, you've never really heard of that where the, Bendix well, stay. only only if only if there's lit, uh, there is that's a real hard you know the the ring gear is really hard right. really hard and and uh, if you take the starter motor out and feel in there uh, feel the the ring gear and slip your finger be between right. between the teeth it should be smooth if there's a lip now there's only I think what 140 teeth 120 um, yeah. so you know you, you just have to put a file between them and file that little burr off on all 120 teeth. You know, I mean, it's easier than taking the engine out. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. a lot easier. So, well, I'm going to just try, you know, I yeah. took it apart and I'll try it again. If it sticks again, uh, I'll do it. But I, I'm going to get one of those English, uh, you know, the all metal pull yeah. starters because those plastic ones, I'm not real happy. And you read online you know, the ones they're just junk, right? They don't last long, so. Yeah, it's, it's, it's real sad. It's just, real, you just wish that stuff was being made. When, you know, when I was running the shop, if I could buy a clutch for $50 or a clutch for 500, I mean, help me out, I'd buy it for 500. Um, first of all, I could make more money on it to my customer and at 500, maybe it was 10 times as good as the one for 50. Yeah. And I didn't have to do the clutch again for free. So I, I, I encourage everybody to buy the best parts that they can to drive the market to supply good parts. But it's, um, we're overwhelmed by those who shop by price. So. Well, if anybody online now knows where to uh, uh, get one of these metal ones in the US, uh, I, I'd appreciate working through John and letting me know. Yeah, you can un unmute yourself, let us know. I mean, 
I tell you to go to Paul Deershaw and just get a used one, but chances are he doesn't have any because those are, you know, the, the original ones are, are so old. I've got one. I think, no, I don't know if I've got one or not. Yeah. My original one lasted 60 years or 50 yeah. years, whatever yeah. it is. And these, these new ones, and the car only has 7,000 miles on it. And I've gone through three pull starter switches. And, oh, geez. And it's just not fun, right? It's a pain in the butt. Yeah. Yeah, I was... I was at the gym the other morning and there was another one of those, you know, good looking, thin, strong women lifting weights far more than I could ever lift. And um, she was looking outside and she goes, how old is your car? <laughs> I said, 58 years, you know, so yeah. yeah. Hey, John. Yes. Hi, it's Walter. Um, what about using, um, you know, I, if all you can get is a cheap switch, um, add a starter solenoid um, before the starter and use the switch just to turn on the solenoid. Sure, sure, you can always get a, a solenoid. You can always, but if, <laughs> if the starter switch sticks, so use the pull to run the solenoid and the solenoid runs the starter. That's, Correct. That's possible, that's possible, so. It's like on the, on the later, on the MGBs, uh, the lousy switches, you have to add relays or, or they'll burn out immediately. <laughs> yes, yeah. So that, that's an option, yes. And of course you do have, uh, Michael, you do have the crank, so. Yep, no, I, I, starting it's not a problem. I just don't wanna, you know, burn up my, my Bendix or, or yeah. flywheel gear, yeah. you know, and so. Yeah. All right. Okie doke, right, thank you very much, Walter. Thanks, Michael, where, where are you from? Uh, I'm in Denver, uh, Evergreen, Colorado. Oh, okay. All right. Well, Paul's just up the street from you. So yeah, I've worked with Paul a lot. So. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm going to mute everybody and now we're going to go to the next one. Okay. This is, um, uh, oh, this goes on, this goes on. This is, uh, yeah, this is all Michael stuff here. So, um, okay. All right. From Judd, everybody, my XPAG TD block is currently at the machinist. Judd, you can unmute yourself. It appears the block has already been bored to 60 over. The cylinder walls are mirror smooth. I suspect the machinist will bore 80 over. Should the bore be mirror smooth or should they show a cross hatching? Um, and any particular worries uh, about going to 80 thousandths? It's nice to go to 80 thousandths because then the connecting rod fits in from the top. <laughs> That's real. I think up around there, it, it, it fits in from the top, but you don't bore the block until you have pistons, until you have pistons. And when you buy the pistons, the rings come in an envelope and they either say Divas, Grant, or Hastings. And if they don't, you buy more rings that say Divas, Grant, or Hastings. Because um, we had, I think we had three or four engines, right? right towards the tail end of when I, when I was turning the shop over to Forrest. Um, we, had, we had like three or four X-Bag engines that we had to take apart again and replace the rings because the rings were worthless. So get good rings. Now, um, that kind of goes to uh, further down. I was asking, Moss offers these Aerolite three ring pistons. Yeah. I don't know what they're, do you know anything? Are those the, Hastings well, rings? Do you know? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know, but I do know that the, the, the pistons are the pistons just hold the rings. What's working right. what's working here are the rings. Okay. So um, the rings have to be a a number one. So if you can get eighty over pistons, that's like three three ring pistons? She said it doesn't seem like enough, but I, you know the the late model MGB only has three rings. So it cuts down on the friction a whole lot. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff, Joe, there's a lot of stuff about that engine that is so peculiar, peculiar to that engine. And I have a lot of information written down. So if you send me an email, John Twist at universitymotorsltd.com, it's probably behind me maybe. I can't read what's behind me, but you can go on my website, same time you press the PayPal button. And, and uh, send me an email and I'll send you all the information I've got about, about the, the, uh, the block and so forth. Because there's just a lot, of, a lot of stuff on there that you 
want to do so you don't have to do it again. One thing I would encourage you to do is get the bottom end of the block a line board or a line hone right. instead of fitting the rear seal. So okay. that's, um, that, that's just from my experience. Um, but there's a whole lot of a whole lot of stuff, and I've got all, all the facts and figures, and, and uh, I, I help you out a, a whole lot there. So, I mean, uh, oh, you know, what the, was that? What was that third um, ring brand? It was Hastings, Davis, and Davis and Grant, G R A N T. Grant? Yep. Good. Thanks. And those are those are cast iron rings. Those are all really really good rings. Now there's a there's a guy. Um, um, out there, you can find him by googling his name. If I can only remember it, um, uh, it'll have to boil out later. He's got a lot of OEM <coughs> bearings, piston rings, stuff like that. But um, those those cast iron rings, those, those are the ones you want. The old Hastings rings were five seven seven nines. That was the part number on the Hastings rings. Those things were great, but you can't buy them anymore. Hastings says, hey, we'll make them, no problem at all. How many thousand sets do you want? <laughs> you know? So it's uh, just big, they don't do that small uh, production stuff anymore. It's too bad. So, all right, so anyway, that, that'll do it. And uh, Judd, send me know, I've got anybody else too who wants information about XPAG engines. There's just a lot of stuff in there, oh my gosh. Everything from the thread sizes to, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff in there. This peculiar, you know, just to, to, to that, that engine. So anyway, so thank you very much. I'm going, where, where are you calling from, Judd? Uh, South Carolina, up around uh, Gallonsville, outside of Greenville. Okay, all right. Yep, I, uh, I should be wearing my Brits and Grits t-shirt. There's a guy in Grambling. Uh, yeah, I'm right around the corner from Grand right. Bill Sapp. Yeah. He, he was original owner of a 75 MGB, died of lung cancer, oh my gosh, 10 years ago, I bet. He, um, his grandfather had, had, uh, had, had served the state of South Carolina in the War of Northern Aggression. And, and uh, my, my grandfather had a lot of, a lot of memorabilia uh, during the depression, he was doing pretty well, and people would come to him and sell him things, and and um, and he just stacked it, stacked it up in the attic of, of his business. And and long after his death, my cousin and I were going through that room with all this cool stuff in it. Nobody else wanted to come, so nobody else got the good stuff, and and we were taking turns getting good stuff. And I I get I, the thing I got I got a, a, a huge poster the Emancipation Proclamation, and the next item up was an autographed picture of Robert E Lee, and I told Bill Sapp I said you know if I'd got that I would have just given it to you. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Anyway, okay. So I'm gonna mute everybody, and here we go. And now we've got Harry who blew a core plug a couple weeks ago that's on a 73B. So, yep. so um, all right, so. Um, I'm here. Is the engine in or out of the car? It's in the car. Uh, all right, so there's four freeze plugs. And, yeah, I, and if one of them's popped out, the rest of them are gonna pop out too. So the, the ones along the side, the ones along the side, you know, you gotta take you got to take the distributor and the heater control valve and, and the alternator and all, oil filter all out of the way, drill holes in them, drive a punch into them, twist them out of there, get them out of there, use a, a brush on the end of a drill or a die grinder and clean up the, the seat really, really well. Buy new 1 in 5 sixteenths freeze plugs uh, from Napa. And you put them in there and you dimple the top of them. The idea is to flatten them. So you use two hammers. Use one hammer against it and you hit that hammer with another hammer. But of course you can't do that because you can't get access. You just, so you're leaning over the carburetor side of the engine. You've gone inside and you've taken the, the, the comforter off your bed and you fold it all, all up while your wife's away and, and lean it up on over the carburetors and you're leaning over the carburetors and you're holding the one hammer and smacking the other one. 
and getting them as, as tight as you can. And when you, when you tunk them with a hammer, they should sound just like the cylinder block. Then, before you put all those ancillaries back in place, mix up some JB Weld and smear it between the freeze plug and the cylinder block. Now that stuff is runny, it's plastic, it doesn't run very fast, but it's plastic. So you have to keep going back and you might take two applications, but put it all around the, the, the circumference of the, of the freeze plug so the JB Weld prevents it from getting blown out again. Once that's done, you can paint it black, no one will ever see it. Now the rear, the rear one you can do in place. There's a hole. There's a hole in the in rear engine bearing plate. So you get a long bolt and you put a washer on this side and a washer on that side. And you put a nut on the inside of the bearing plate and start screwing the, the um, bolt in and the nut holds it, holds it tight, and I'm trying to do this, and as you tighten it up, it goes up, 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 and then hits and holds against the rear freeze plug. You can just leave it there. Don't get a, you know, you're, you're limited in space there, and getting that nut started on the bolt can be kind of dicey, but it's a whole lot easier than taking the engine out, and probably safer than just going in there now and smearing some JB Weld in there. If you don't mind, just leave the bolt there. Just leave it there. If that's too offensive, if that's just going to kill you, oh God, I can't have that bolt holding that freeze plug in, then go ahead and smear some JB Weld in there. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure your index finger is long enough or thin enough to get the JB Weld in there. So you're going to have to use some kind of wooden stick and mirrors and lights and so forth. But that's, that's the trick. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. So where, where are you calling from? Northern Virginia, about 10 miles outside of D.C., south. Oh, okay. All right. Tyson's Corners around there someplace? Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Great. Yeah, it's so frustrating because you can't, you can't push the plug back in. You, you, you know, you go, well, maybe I can just, I can just um, push a, a rag back in the hole and it, no, you're done. <laughs> Have to get towed home. Have to get towed home, and then, yep. and then, uh, yeah, it's really. I great. got, I got towed home. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Uh, I'm going to mute everybody again, and we're going to a one two three. And I have no idea what this is about. It's about less advertising his custom pistol business. So okay. So anyway. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Maybe someone's background includes custom pistols. I don't know. I've got no rules here. So, uh, let's see, uh, Michael, I also had to pull out the gas tank to seat the body. So that's someone else besides Rich Caldwell who said that he couldn't put the body on his MGA without dropping the gas tank. So. Yeah, and also, uh, John, on that uh, freeze plug, I lost a freeze plug in my MGA. Fortunately, it was the one between the distributor and uh, coil, so I had access and I could pound it back in. But I also bought a, uh, a couple of the uh, freeze plugs that you uh, bolt in. There are mm -hmm. two plates that bolt together with a like a half inch spanner and uh, just for emergencies, they're kind of, you know, I can plug them in. You can even do the rear one. They say you can leave them in but uh, you buy them, I think, at any auto parts or online or whatever, but I've got a couple of them in my uh, toolkit in the back of my MG just in case. Safety, safety items, that's cool. Those, those expandable freeze plugs also work on a rear axle, on a banjo differential. The, uh, the half shaft fits into the rear hub and there's supposed to be a freeze plug over, over the end of that. Um, but sometimes stuff just doesn't fit quite right and it weeps and it weeps oil out of the differential and it'll, it'll get out underneath the spinner then get on the wheel. And if you take a um, expandable freeze plug and push that down inside there and expand it out, it'll stop, it'll stop it from weeping. Those do have, those, do, those are real handy to have in some, some places. Thanks. Uh, John. 
Yeah. Real quick on the freeze plugs, I discovered when I pulled the block out of the TV, the previous owner had used a plumber's plug, about an inch to an inch and a half thick rubber plug stuck in and you know you turn the bolt and it expands. The problem was stuck all the way in and touched the inner wall of the block and completely blocked the ability of any coolant to go through the back. So don't buy your freeze plugs at the plumbing store. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, those those XPEG blocks, um, the T-type blocks, the, the, the water pump picks up the water off the bottom of the radiator and then pushes it along a, a chamber on the outside of the on the outside of the block and then that dumps out into the back of the head. That's the idea. And those things just fill up, they get silted up and rusted up and you can get a real impediment to moving moving water through there. Our machine shop, uh, CD machine shop in Hudsonville, Michigan, they've built 100 T-type engines, I bet, uh, or done parts of them. They've done complete engines and, and parts of them. Uh, they have a, um, used to be that you'd take a block and you'd have it dipped in caustic soda, uh, and that would remove the rust, and, and, and that you can still make a case for that. But um, they instead would put the blocks into an oven put it on like self-clean up at five, 600 degrees, it would turn all the carbon into ash. And then when it was done, they'd bombard the block in a special cabinet with these tiny little BBs. I mean, tiny, tiny, tiny little metal BBs. And, and uh, that would knock all the ash off it. And those blocks would come out absolutely clean. But those cooling passages on the x pad, you, you can make a case for, for hooking up your sandblaster and just blowing through those and just getting the, as much junk freed up out of there as possible so the water can flow. But a freeze plug like you've described really is, is an impediment, so. Now, Judge, we're back to Judge. Um, oh, yep, you asked me about the air Yeah, you, you answered, yeah. Okay. Oh, here we go, Ruth, Arnold. Hey, s someone, someone's, Someone took my, ch after I made my challenge and then forgot to bring mine, um, Ruth has an, an adjustable spanner inherited from her father. Ruth, are, are you on? Can you, uh, you, can you unmute yourself and show us your spanner? Ruth? Either Ruth can't unmute herself or she's gone or something, but okay, all right. From Simon. From Simon, this this has to do with Dave Kershaw. Well, maybe somebody who couldn't get the uh, um, the sound working. Um, and thanks, Simon, again for the back the backdrop that I'm, I'm able to use here. Okay, um, Mike Kalaski, 59 MGA 1600 hasn't run in 40 years. Engine turns freely. How do I flush oil? in the pan and crankcase and gas tank and what oil to use for startup and break in. Okay, so you, you can, um, you can um, dump a gallon of, of diesel oil in the engine. And then once the brakes are done, tow the car, you know, and, and uh, just let that, let, let that oil go everywhere throughout the engine. And, um, um, the oil and, and fuel oil, and that'll that'll loosen stuff up and blow stuff out out of the way, and then all the debris will be caught in the oil filter. Then when you drain the pan, maybe some of that extra stuff will come out. There's a lot of goopy, thick metal deposit that that builds up in the bottom of the pan. It just does, and you the only way to get it out of there is to take the pan off. But if you don't do anything, it just seems to sit there. So um, the oil that you want to use for startup is Valvoline VR1, Victor Romeo 1, probably stands for Valvoline Racing, 20 oh, 2050, 2050. So, um, so your MGA 1600 that hasn't turned, it hasn't run in all that time, you take the distributor out, go through it yourself or send it away and have it done. <clears throat> Rebuild the carburetors. <clears throat> easiest place to rebuild them is right on the engine um, because it's the perfect vice. They don't move anywhere. 
on the other hand, you can't see what you're doing underneath. So uh, maybe you have to take those off, get those done. The gas tank does have a drain. There'll be a rust in the gas tank. There is no filter provided in the original MGA. There's no filter until you get to about, uh, what, 1971 or something um, on the B. There's no filter, but you want to install a filter, absolutely. So uh, take one of your old lines and grind the, grind the, uh, the old line off it and put new gates, rubber hose on it and a, and a filter and, and use high test gas. I just, I just bought some 93 octane sort of bugs me, you know, I think we're still paying for, for uh, Hazel, Hazelwood's beaching of the Exxon Valdez with those high prices, but um, that's the best you can do. And then later on, you can step down to 889 octane, see if that runs okay for you, but I'd start with the higher stuff, just, just because I would. Um, you wanna make sure you got oil in your differential, drain out the diff in the, in the gearbox, refill those, Drain out the drain out the antifreeze, whatever there is left of it. Uh, flush it, maybe as best you can with a garden hose. Change your belts and hoses. Um, the fuel pump, you probably have to take off. All you can do is clean the points. I've got a nice video about doing that. Um, make sure the brakes work first, and then start it up. You know, then go and drive it. See see what happens. Chances are, after that amount of time, because someone didn't change the oil before they stored it. I mean, I'm just guessing. You think? Um, um, You're talking to them. <laughs> okay. So, so um, it's the old oil. It's got a lot of acid in it. I mean, not a lot, but it's got some. And we, I don't have any bearings here to show you tonight. But if I did, it looks like worms ate them. It looks just like worms underneath bark on a, on a limb or something. It's just eaten away. It's just unbelievable, the damage. So you may end up after this amount of time dropping that sump. Again, you can do it in place. Don't have to jack the engine up. There's five bolts in the front. They come off with, with extreme difficulty and go on even harder, but it's still easier than taking the engine out. So just take your time at it. You need an offset. Uh, wrench, kind of the snake in the end of it, and um, and you can get the sump off, and then you can change one main bearing, and you can change the rod bearings, and you can change the oil pump. And that'll give your oil pressure back. Um, can't do anything with the front and rear mains. You know, just just drive it and hope that that they're doing what they're supposed to. If the rear main is is eaten up and it's blowing a lot of oil towards the back of the engine. Of course, the rear main is going to leak a lot because that scroll thread that's on there is only designed to, to move just a little bit of oil, not a whole lot of oil spraying against it. But anyway, it's always easier to, to do the stuff in, in place than, than take, you know, take it all apart and start all over again. And, and because if you take your engine out, if you do, um, you're looking at, you know, I don't know, two, three, four thousand bucks because every single part you look at is going to be faulty. You know, the lifters aren't any good. Cam's not any good. You know, the valves aren't any good. The valve guides aren't, aren't any good. Chain's no good. Tensioner's no good. But if you don't see them, you can't confirm that. So, and it'll, it'll run. So, but it just, it, it drives me crazy to put something back into an engine that I know is faulty. Um, just because it does, you know, I just, you can't, you can't, it's hard to escape, escape that, that attitude. My late wife used to say, um, she said, once you open them up, they develop an appetite, you know, <laughs> they'll take your paycheck, lots of paychecks for all those parts. So anyway, that's sort of an overview, Mike, on, on, on that. So where, where are you calling from? Uh, Cincinnati. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay, a lot of a lot of MGs in Ohio. My my gut is that there are more um, there are more MGs in Ohio per capita than any other state. That's just because I, I I'm close to Ohio. I know lots and lots and lots of owners, and there used to be about a jillion dealers. Every little tiny town had an MG dealer, and it's one of the last states that got settled before the planners got there first. So all the roads, the old roads, follow ridge lines and valleys and they're natural roads.
where as you get out to Michigan and the, and the guys got, got out here with a, a straight edge and the uh, geodesic foot and laid out all the roads before we got here. And so everything is just straight as the eye can see. So for those couple of reasons, I mean, obviously there's more MGs in New York and California because the population's higher, but per capita. So Ohio is a nice place to own an, an MG. So. Okay. Say again what uh, the flush, the first flush of the uh, oh, engine I, with? You know, use use di diesel, diesel oil. I mean, just uh, just diesel, diesel oil. oil. Okay. Um, no, not diesel oil. Diesel fuel. Diesel fuel. That's yeah. what I thought you said. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And just turn it over by hand and. Yeah, if, yeah, yeah, with a starter motor or um, even if you get, you take spark plugs out so it spins e easily, right. you know, and just, just, just get it all lubed and flowing and then drain it out and hope that that little bit of, of movement uh, helps discharge a lot more stuff that's sitting in the bottom of the sump. Um, so. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right. I'm going to mute everybody again. Here we go. And with Sherry, everyone, Sherry says hello. Hello, Sherry. Um, and uh, uh, from Judd, for Walter, if the towel works, consider wrapping the bow with foam pipe insulation. Thank you. Thank you. That, that insulation that you put around your, your hot or cold water pipes in, in your basement of your house so they don't drip or don't lose the heat. Um, that's a that's a perfect thing, and it, and it provides a real nice even look from the outside. Even though it looks a little weird to someone who doesn't know, or someone who does know, but someone who doesn't know might just think that it goes up that high. That's a real good idea, Judd. Thank you very 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 much for that. And from Mr. Uh, Mr. Guinness, try black pipe insulation. Okay. So and um, from Frank uh, Cataldo, what about pipe insulation? All right, so um, all right, so here we've got from Ot Rankin. Ot, you can unmute yourself. It's just a comment here about probably something I said last time. If I didn't, I meant to. Um, and uh, Ot says that he installed a new Bell exhaust system on his 78 MGB. It fit perfectly, looks great, and I can tell you from my experience with Bell exhausts that it sounds great. So I tried another one in my MGA um, prior to putting a bell system on, and it sounded like a motorcycle with no muffler. I mean, it's just horrid. It's horrid. Um, I mean, I you know I don't mind a little bit of noise, but you know you just couldn't drive it in the neighborhood. So I got the a bell system. Now, John, the reason I put the bell on was I had a Monza uh, okay. system on it, and the way it's bent. It's so low beneath the rear axle that I was hitting every, it's only about two inches off the ground. And I was hitting everything, every kind of a speed bump or anything. I was just dragging that exhaust pipe across, across that axle. So that's the reason right. why I went with the bell and it really fits nice. Great. Who, who'd you buy that from, Ott? I got it from Abington Spares. Okay, okay. It was uh, 350 bucks. Yeah, well, it just, it's, it's, um, it'll stay on the car for a long time. And they, it's got yeah. a great sound and it fits nice. So that's very nice. Back very in good. the day, there were um, ANSA. ANSA is still my favorite. And Moss dropped them out of the catalog because I think the two parts together were like $1,000. And they said, there's no point putting it in there. No one's going to buy it at that price. So it was uh, ANSA, Monza. Stebro, there used to be lots of different ind independent muffler companies, but since our newest MGB is now 40 years old, um, the, the movement on, on mufflers just isn't enough. Walker used to sell all those muffler pieces, and they all fit pretty well. It was real nice, but now the stuff comes from who knows where, um, and, and um, some of it just uh, isn't, isn't fitted very well. And then the problem that I had was that um, there was no muffling at all. Someone, I it just they, I think they missed that step in the factory of stuffing whatever it is that they put in there to suck up the noise. So anyway, uh, thank you very much. Where, where are you calling from? Uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Oh, hey, South Carolina is weighing in heavily tonight. Okay. 
I'm going to mute everybody. Here we go. All right, Sherry. Sherry, I'm having a 70, uh, she's got a 72 midget, is having issues heating up fast within 30 minutes when stopped at the stoplight. Once I start moving, it starts cooling down. Is there anything I can do to keep it cool when sitting at a stoplight? No blocks in the radiator and a freshly flushed system and new hoses. So the, the cooling system has got, has got just a couple parts to it. You've got the cylinder block and you can have stuff stuck in there. MGCs have a, um, a design problem. Um, it's like carpal tunnel. There's a hole in there that's too small for the, for the um, uh, coolant to get through and MGC engines run hot. You can take care of that. I'm not familiar with that at all on a, on a B um, or on a, on a midget, certainly a 72 midget. Um, so you got the water pump that picks the water up out of the bottom of the radiator, pushes it back into the block. It goes through the block, comes out the, the thermostat, which you buy and get a rating on that. Uh, new thermostats probably have the same quality control as timing lights, and, and uh, God knows what they actually open up at. This, is, this isn't Jerry's problem, because it would be a problem all, all the time. And then um, so you got the block, the water pump, the radiator, and the hoses. And she says the radiator's been cleaned out. The water pumps, as a rule, the, I mean, there's exception to every rule, the water pumps never go bad. They wobble, they leak, they make noise, but they never stop pumping. I think I've, in 45 years, I've only got two or three that the impellers came off of. So it's, it's, uh, it's really, really rare. So we're left with timing. The, the, um, the cooling system is designed to dissipate a certain amount of heat. That heat increases if the timing is incorrect. When the timing is perfect, you get about one third of the energy of the gasoline available at the flywheel, one third out in the, in the cooling system, and another third out in the exhaust. And whatever you try to do, you never can get more out of the flywheel than, than that third. Um, you, you can diminish it and increase the heat coming out of the exhaust or, or out of the cooling system. So let me propose that maybe that's what's going on. And again, to Sherry, you got to time this thing at 32 degrees before. You can contact me. I can give you the, the information. The problem with the 72 midget is the timing marks. There are just three of them that hang, hang off the, the bottom of the, of the front timing cover. Those have been folded back up underneath the last time the engine came out to do a clutch, so you can't even see the timing marks. Um, it, they're, a, they're a real hassle to fit. If you've got points, you can set the timing static, and that, that all often makes more sense, because also on the midget, besides the timing marks being on the bottom, there's about that much space between the bottom of the radiator and the top of the uh, well, front suspension part of the, part of the frame. So seeing those timing marks is just a tremendous, pro tremendous project. So, and, you, and once they're bent up, you can't unbend them in place because you can't get to them. Um, but you can, sometimes you can see them just enough if you're static timing it. So Sherry, I would say to you that my guess is that there's something with the, with the timing. And so the engine's making too much heat and it can't get rid of it. That's a, that's just a, that's a guess. That's a guess. Armchair analysis at 500 miles. John, what did you just say about the MGC uh, overheating? What was well, there's a there's a, a passageway in the bottom left front of the block um, that isn't large enough. It's it's like that, that that let's see that about that big, and it should be like that big. And there's a plate that you can take up. You go on, go online and just look for MGC cooling block enhancement, something like that. And um, there's a plate you can take off and get right down in there with, with a die grinder and hog, hog that hole out. And oh boy, now all of a sudden you're getting a whole lot more coolant running through the radiator than you were before. Okay, all right, so. We're, we're going to mute everybody again. 
and we're pushing we're pushing nine o'clock i'm gonna have to say one more time maybe i will at the very end about please go on my on my website and look for the paypal button and help me out with my expenses and and um so my daughter and i can eat it's not quite that <laughs> it's not quite that um, but anyway i do appreciate um all right from uh, nuno um oh the costa you must be from toronto so um we'll give luber luber plate a shot so thanks all right so the next one up is from, from john keating to everybody um oh all right he says it's it's a compliment he says thanks for producing all these seminars and uh, is there any way of catching up on the seminars i've missed yes i've been posting i'm trying to post them all up to youtube so if you go to my channel on youtube university motors ltd um, I've got 300 and some videos there, and the and the newest ones uh, that date from maybe June of this year through now are re, are are these seminars. So, but <clears throat> you want to be sitting on nails because you'll you'll fall asleep watching them. Um, it's <laughs> different when you're watching them live if you get to par participate. So, John Keating, where where are you calling from? Uh Worcester in the UK. Oh my gosh! So what's it about a hundred o'clock there right now? Uh, it is one thirty. You have to work tomorrow. Yeah, but I'm working from home. Oh, all right. Okay, all right. Okay, a little late, later start in the morning. So, okay. Anyway, so you, you can go there, John. Thanks very much. Always nice to see somebody from the home countries here. So. All right, I'm going to mute everybody, mute all. Here we go again. And from Mike Ellis, I've got a 74 BGT with 66,000 miles. Engine runs well. I'm planning to drive it more next year, like 5,000 miles. Should I consider having hardened valve seats installed in the head, or should I leave well enough alone? If you're going to make one 5,000-mile trip, like you're going to leave from, I don't know, Let's say you live in Pocatello, Idaho, and you're going to drive to New York City and back along Route 66 and back up home. You can make a case for, for doing that. But if it's just 5,000 miles in incremental runs around where you are, I wouldn't do it. You can check the compression on your engine. Just check the compression. You're looking for consistency within 10%. It really doesn't matter if the number you get is 90 or 190. Well, it does, but the compression gauges, the precision of the uh, of the of the the accuracy of the gauges is uh, all over the place, and it depends on whether you're spinning it over on a cold morning or whether it's just been uh, just been run and stuff like that. So you're looking for consistency within 10%. So if you get 100, 125, 125, 135. 120, hey, you're great, you're great, you know, but if you get 125. Did I hear what? Why? Um, we're gonna mute, Doug, we're gonna mute you here. Uh, there we go, okay, Doug's muted again. Um, so um, anyway, if, if you get you know, like 125, 125, 80, 125, no, time to go and when you go and, and when, you have, when you take the sonar head off and have the new, valve guides installed, there are two important things to keep in mind. One, use the old fashioned cast iron valve guides. In 1975, when they took the lead out of the gasoline, it was like, oh my gosh, we're not gonna be able to drive our cars anymore. The cylinder heads are all gonna fail and the valves are all gonna get sucked up in the head and, and on and on and on. It turned out that it wasn't, it wasn't true. And everyone said, oh my gosh, you know, the, the, the lead in the gasoline helps lubricate the valve guides. And, and without the lead, you know, we got to go to these phosphor bronze, the gold ones. So they did that, but it turns out that the phosphor bronze ones, you have to open up the clearance between the valve stem and the inside of the valve guide to two or two and a half thousandths. So they don't crimp down and grab and gall the valve. Um, so the valves are wobbling around in their seat, and they shouldn't be. They should be a whole lot tighter than that. So it turns out that if you use cast iron guide, guides, they work just fine. 
Turns out they're just great. There's nothing wrong with them at all. So use cast iron guides. And also on the MGA and MGB, use umbrella oil seals. Um, right now, there's some little O-rings that are supposed to go down underneath the collet and keep oil from, from getting um, sucked down into the valve guide. But you can use um, Felpro. I know this number off the top of my head. Um, and I don't. Uh, if you got a note, send me a note. It's a repeating number. Oh my gosh, Felpro. I can't remember the number. I'm embarrassed. Um, anyway, use umbrella oil seals. You can use these on T-types too. The problem is that there's a deflector that's normally fitted underneath the inner spring that keeps oil off the valve guide. If you install the deflectors and the umbrella oil seals, the deflectors chop up, just chop up the, the oil seal so it, it's of no, no use. Um, so you have to take those deflectors off, but anyone in a machine shop who's doing this would know that. When you go to put hardened seats in the head, you only have to put them on the exhaust valves because the inlet valves are always being washed in an ice cold mixture of air fuel, uh, that ice cold air fuel mixture. Um, but the exhaust valves, the exhaust valves, that's where all the heat is. Um, so those are the ones that require the hardened seats. You don't have to change the valves. The original valves are just great. So. Thank you, John. Yeah, Mike, we're, well, what are you gonna do? Where, where are you gonna drive? Oh, no, it, like you mentioned, it's just uh, a cumulative of, okay. of many, many small trips, yeah, you know? Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, just just wait for it to fail. So what, okay. what's, that, what's that in the background? Is that the Golden Gate Bridge? It is. It's just a, it's just a, uh, well, I, yeah. I didn't figure you're up, up there. Isn't that where the uh, Planet of the Apes started up? Yeah, that right there. The no, I'm in, I'm in, uh, I'm in Maryland. Oh, all right. Okay. Yeah, very good. Okay. All right. Okay, all right, thanks a lot. We're gonna mute everybody and here we go. We're going to our next one um, from Randy. In my opinion, what is the best top, the best fabric top for an MGC? And I would say Robin's top. Now, that's for a plastic top. Oh, that sounds too tacky. They're not plastic, they're vinyl. Vinyl's just an uh, upscale name for plastic. So that's what the original ones were. So those are really nice. The canvas tops, those are really sweet. They look really nice, but they're thicker than the vinyl tops. So when you go to fold them into the back, they don't fold quite as well. So if you're gonna get a, a, um, a canvas top, I mean, go for gold and get a tan top, right? I mean, they look beautiful. Well, then you'd better be carrying some Resolve carpet cleaner with you and the, and the brush that goes with it. Because if you think about the top, it's going to get a fingerprint on it. If you put your finger on it, it's going to get a handprint on it. And if you put a, your hand on the top, which you're going to have to, to put it up and put it down, it's going to look like a raccoon crawled on it. So they get dirty so quickly. I'm, I'm no fan of light carpet or light tops and MGs because there's oil and grease. I mean, our, our, it's, that's the way our cars are. Um, so if you're going to get a, a fabric top, get a black top. That's each his own, but that's what I do. If you want to get the exotic tops, then you go to the MG Owners Club in England, MG Owners Club in Swayze. And they have, you want a black top with red piping, you want a red top with black piping, they got all kinds of wild stuff there. So car, the cars are more original here in the States than they are in England, absolutely, or in Australia. So anyway, that's what I like, the Robin's top. Okay, um, and I wanted to find out from Randy where you were calling from. If you, Randy can unmute himself for a minute here, but maybe Randy's gone, so he didn't even hear my answer. I, uh, oh, here we go, okay. Oh, I heard your answer. Hey, hey, and you're right I below, moved, right I moved 31 miles down the road. Yep. Okay, all right, Randy. Randy's uh, one of your resources in the, in the Northern Virginia, greater DC area to, to help, uh, help work on your car. 
He used to work for Dale Moore. Those of you who've been around for 100 years remember Dale. So, and right, yeah. there, right on top of Randy's picture is Bobo Tanner from Nashville. Bobo, pleasure. Always a pleasure to see you. So, okay. So, I'm going to mute everybody here. And Randy from Virginia. Thanks, John. Yep. And then, um, and then uh, from A123, I missed what John said regarding the dial back timing light. What was the answer? Why am I seeing only seeing 60 to 134 participants and I'm not seeing myself? Um, uh, well, you only see a certain number of people. I, I expect you, you, I'm, I'm, there's all different ways to do this. You do it on a, your iPhone. You only see yourself or me. Um, you can do it on a tablet. You can do it on an iPad. Maybe that's the same as a tablet. I'm not an a, a Apple guy. Now, or you can do it on your, on your desktop. And there are all different kinds of displays, but um, if you saw all 138, you wouldn't see us at all. We'd be like little tiny eraser heads, you know, on, on your screen. So there must be some way to toggle from one screen to another. What did I say about the dial back timing light? Um, there, um, Rich Caldwell weighed in and sa said that, um, no, he was talking about the distributors, strike that. Um, the dial back timing lights, um, you have to have re resistor wire to use them. Um, they only last for so long. They're ultimately handy. They're just great um, to use. And if you're using it at home, um, maybe you won't get as much, you know, bouncing around and damage as my, mine does when I'm out at a show or something, laying it down on the ground and accidentally kicking it and stuff like that. So um, from a123, if you want to know about timing your car, send me a note, call me tomorrow or something, and I'll be happy to, to tune in with you and let you know um, how to use that. So, and where's A123 calling in from? If A123 is still here. I don't, I don't hear anybody. So, okay, so we're going to mute all. And we're, we're running, we're 9.05, um, you know, we'll, we can run to 9.30, I, I love it. Um, hi, John, I know you like to collect gearboxes. That's funny. Um, any chance you might have an overdrive unit and gearbox for 68 MGC you might like to sell? I'm struggling to find one in the UK. So there are a couple of places. Again, we're going to Paul Deershaw. Um, at Sports Car Craftsman in Denver, Colorado. We're going to um, John Esposito at Quantum Mechanics in Maryland. I think he's in Maryland. He does a lot of gearbox work um, because if you got an, if you got a four synchro gearbox now you don't need the whole gearbox, which is frightfully expensive to send, but you do need a main shaft, the intermediate housing, the rear housing, stuff like that. And there are two different gear sets on MGCs. There's the early one, which is the same as an MGB, and then there's the later one, which is, a, which is strictly MGC. So John Keating, are you still on here? Or did you, so, yeah, you're still here. So- Yeah, still here. All right, so- um, so you've got those two, you can send me a note tomorrow if you want, um, and I'll, or send me an email, and I'll, I'll give you those names again. We also have an MGC register in this country. There's two MGC organizations in this country. One is a standalone, the American uh, MGC register, and the other one is the North American MGB register, which also has MGCs in it. And I just got my MGB um, uh, bi-monthly magazine today, and someone had MGC parts for sale. I don't know what was in there, but John Keating sent, sent me a note, and I'll, I'll see if I can get some of these numbers back out. But again, you don't need the whole gearbox. You just need the, you need the main shaft and the intermediate housing, and then, of course, the, the overdrive. So, Great. Thank you, John. I'll send you an email. Okay. All right. So... Thank you. Now we've got, uh, thanks for the Zoom. Um, here we go, we've got uh, Joseph Vins. 
Uh, John, I have a new to me, a big project, hasn't run for about eight years, 72 MGB, would, the, would it be okay to JB weld up the existing freeze plugs? Absolutely. Just clean it first, you know, because JB Weld likes to adhere to metal. Um, no point going to paint or something or other like that. But yes, do it, do it. Because if those freeze plugs pop out on the road, it's just, it's, it's just such a, <laughs> it's just such a hassle, just a hassle. So, so um, Joseph Vins, are you still on? Uh, yes, can you hear me all right, John? Yeah, absolutely. Where, where are you calling from? I'm in uh, Madison, Alabama, which is near Huntsville. Okay, all right. Yeah, we had a big MGA meet in Huntsville in, uh, what, 91, maybe? Oh, uh, I don't think, let's see. Yeah, I was still here. Yeah, I, no, in wait. Huntsville. I, yeah, I was here then. <laughs> I just didn't go. Yeah, yeah, M MGAs. Yeah, it was real nice. It was uh, like in a shopping uh, in a nice big grassy area off a shopping mall or something or other. I got I got a lot of v VHS video from from that that meet. So that sounds um, good. Yeah, I've, I've been working on this and I the engine's pretty clean. And after what you were saying about the freeze uh, freeze plugs, I thought maybe that'd be a good idea. So now I'll go ahead yes. and do it. Yes, excellent idea. Oh, thank you. Okie doke. Well, thanks for thanks for checking in tonight. I'm on, I'm muting everyone again. And now I have Ben. I fear I have a cracked head on my 74 18V engine. I don't want it, I don't want to run it too much and dilute the oil with antifreeze. When you send an MGB head to your Hudsonville machine shop, do you usually supply any valves and springs or just let them deal with it? You got to have the valves, you got to have the springs. They want they want to send you back a, a complete head. So let me talk about cracked heads just for a minute. There are cracks that appear around the exhaust. That's just the way it is. It's the heat. Um, maybe it's uh, impurities in the metal. I, you know, I, I don't know. But those, those are, if they're tiny, tiny little cracks that extend a sixteenth of an inch, then when you have valve inserts, um, seat inserts installed, you can get rid of the cracks. But if the cracks go beyond the insert, the machine shop will say we don't want to do it because something's going to loosen up and that valve insert that valve seat that insert's going to fall out the other crack that you get which is a real common crack is on the outside of the head on the boss that holds the center stud on the right hand side of the engine um, this this is um, avoidable and i can tell you why it happens and how to avoid it on a future head Right now, there are 11 cylinder head studs that hold the clamp the cylinder head tight to the block. 10 of them run through holes that are 7 16 in diameter. But the center one on the right hand side, the one between the second and third spark plug, goes through a 3 8 hole. Now, when you put the cylinder head gasket down on top of, the, on top of those studs and begin to clamp the plate, the cylinder head gasket loses its thickness and squishes. It's got to go someplace. It moves as you're tightening it down. The cylinder head gasket where it's, it's located right around the 3-8 stud then has got to move against that 3-8 stud. It, and, and it goes up into, it moves up into that 7 16 hole. So you've got a 32nd of an inch all the way around the outside of the stud into which that cylinder head gasket can move, except on the center stud on the right side of the engine. And that's jammed. That's got no place to go. It's the 3 8 hole and it's the 3 8 stud. So that doesn't move. Instead, it bunches up. Because it bunches up and you're tightening up the head and you've got this line right in the center. I'm trying to do this so it doesn't, I'm so pixelated here. The head actually bows, not that much, but it bows. When you tighten it up, it bows it. It puts it under stress, and that's why it always cracks on the outside of the boss, but either, either just to the rear of the number two spark plug or just in front of the number three spark plug. So to avoid this in the future, take a chamfering tool and chamfer the underside of the cylinder head, put an angle on it, countersink it, um, a ways, just uh, 
just a cheap countersink will do it. And that'll provide a place for that gasket to move. Now it will no longer weep out of the right-hand side of the engine, nor um, will the cylinder head crack. So, um, but anyway, if you take it to, to a CD engine service in Hudsonville, Michigan, they're gonna want the whole head. So you can find heads, any head you can make work, um, even off a of Nash Metropolitan, even though the throats are about as big around it as my finger, um, but for an extra couple hundred bucks, Dave at CD Machine Shop will open that up, um, port and polish it, and they put in the, the proper size valves and just make it work. Um, John, do you know why that one hole was only three-eighths of an inch? It's, uh, it's, for, it's, it's the pivot point on the head. Otherwise, the head could move around like this on top of the block. It's the pivot point. So it, it locates it exactly. So it just, it's just, uh, it, it, they, they didn't weep when they came out of the, out of the uh, factory to begin with, but once you change the cylinder head gaskets and so forth on them, then, then they, you get this problem. I had, a, I had a hell of a time getting my head off because of that one bolt. <laughs> just, oh yeah, where it's all rusted up in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, well we have, I know in the past, we'd taken everything else out of the way and then turned the head in place, spun the head in place, take it out, take it over to, to the press, heat up the head with a torch, and then put the press on that on that stud. And it, of course, it'll come right out. So. Okay, so that's that's it for uh, for Ben. Was that Ben? You're calling from uh, Valparaiso or where? Ben, you're unmuted. Unmute. T tell me. Where you're calling from? Where you so you got yeah, it. That, that's the band I thought you were. Okay, all right, great, great. And uh, if if you need some information, Ben, about the machine shop or something, call me and I I, I can provide that that information to to you. Okay, here here we have. Okay, all right, here we go. From David Wren, I have a screwdriver my grandfather used on his Indian motorbike in the early 1900s. It's still straight, so I guess I guess next time we do this, I'll bring my. Uh, that leads us into into dangerous territory if you bring your favorite tool, but bring the favorite your favorite tool from your workshop, and and uh, and show us you know your spanner, your, your screwdriver, um, you know your socket, um, and uh, we we can I I just I, I forgot to bring mine, but that's cool, David Wren. Where, where are you calling from, David Wren? He's still on. David Wren, you're there. I can see you, but you're muted. Yeah, I, yeah I'm from Auckland, New Zealand. Oh, New Z oh my gosh, was it tomorrow there yet, or what? Yeah, already. It's lunchtime. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Well, yeah. All right. Okay. I'm looking forward to coming down s sometime. So, so be before the next earthquake hits and reduces to Auckland to zip. So oh, we don't get we don't get earthquakes. We just get volcanoes. Okay. It's Christchurch. Um, Christchurch gets earthquakes and we get volcanoes. So. All right. Okay. Well, it's always something. That's what uh, <laughs> Saturday Night Live, that's what Rosanna, Rosanna, Dana uh, said. It's always something. So Yeah, yeah always I, something. Yeah. I just, well, where was that volcano that blew up when the excursion boat was there? And they, I don't know, a dozen people died and the rest of them got really burned. That was that was offshore from you someplace, wasn't it? Yeah, that was down. That was some um, what we called Bay Appendies, about 200 k's from here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 All right. Well, hey, thanks a lot, David, and congratulations on the on the screwdriver. There's yeah, a that's book. Right. There's a I book. Don't... There's a book available that's the history of the screwdriver. And it's written by a New York Times columnist whose editor told him to do a history of a tool. And he he, he said, I want to start with a hammer, but the hammer disappears into caveman days. So yeah, so yeah. it was the history of the screwdriver, and it's a it's it's just this fascinating thing about knights outfits and making screws. You know, it's a cottage industry, and every screw is fitted with its own nut because there's no such thing as standard threads or lathes or anyway. So yeah, okay. I'm okay, gonna, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for being here, David. Uh, All right. So now we muted everybody again, and we're going to. Uh, Simo, I put a Harley Davidson muffler on my 
1500 MGA, both engines are about the same size. So similar, but now it sounds like a motorcycle, my guess is. That's a, that's a pretty small buffalo lung. Is Simo still here? Can you weigh in and tell us how that <laughs> sounded at the end? It's um, sitting in the car, it sounds like a Harley. That's a problem, <laughs> definitely a problem. Um, when you stand back from the car, it sounds pretty neat though. Okay. Um, yeah, what else can I say? I'm in Australia, what would I know? <laughs> okay, do the toilets really flush backwards down there? Um, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. I've been in America often and trying to convince Yanks that it doesn't is a very difficult <laughs> thing there. <laughs> what, a, what a hoot. Hey, <clears throat> thank you very, very much. I'm <clears throat> looking forward to doing a, uh, a, club, a club seminar with the, uh, with the Sydney Club. That'd be great. Yep. Next month or this month or ne next month. So, okay. Actually, great. I'm not even in it. I'm in the Triumph Club. Well, TR3s and TR6s. I'm not in the MG Car Club. My son is. He's got to be. Okay. Very cool. Well, thanks. Thank thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks for being here. All right. I'm going to okay. mute everybody again, and we're going to um, we're going to go on to a Brown. Here's Brown on my 72B. I have a slightly oversized stainless steel exhaust. Over the years of hitting too many parking lot speed bumps, the resonator under the driver's seat finally split. I searched everywhere for a new resonator of the right size, couldn't find one. I ended up taking my car to the neighborhood muffler shop and had them cut it out and just weld in a new stainless steel pipe. It works fine and doesn't sound too bad either. So that's uh, Brown. You can unmute yourself. You're, you've uh, you spelled neighborhood with a with a pre uh, pre American spelling. Where where are you calling from? Yeah, John. It's uh, Dale Brown from Windsor. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay. Well, you know the the MGA only has one muffler in the back, but the, they wanted to they wanted to make the MGB a little quieter, a little more refined. Yep. And that's why it's got the two mufflers on it. I don't know if they're mufflers or resonators, or I, I don't know. Um, I don't know anything about about the science of muffling, muffling at all. Yeah, apparently that center one under underneath the seat was just to change the sound, no no other purpose. So I took it out, and it sounds great. <laughs> sounds great. Hey, wonderful. Okay. Thanks. So um, there, there's a lot of talk about exhaust. Obviously, I mean, obviously. The larger the exhaust, the, le the less the back pressure and the more energy you can get out of your engine because it's no longer pumping the exhaust, having to pump the exhaust out of the engine and down the, down the tailpipe. But it turns out that's not true at all. So the TD, the original TD had like an inch and a quarter pipe on it, just this tiny, tiny little pipe. It doesn't matter what you put on an MGB, you can get you can get a, a relatively restricted exhaust, or you can get a great huge free flow exhaust. It makes not one iota of difference. Um, and this is, this is based on, on my associate, Carl Heidemann, who's done 12 or 1400 pulls on a dynamometer with every imaginable add-on and replacement part you can possibly get for an MGB. So the proof is in the pudding and it's not measurable. It doesn't show up at, at half a horsepower or a quarter of a horsepower. So it's, 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 um, its effect is negligible. So next time you don't need to buy the big bore exhaust, which hits on all the speed bumps. Just get the, that, this bell system right now, this bell system's nice. And um, um, you want it fitted as close as you can up, up underneath the vehicle. We used to have to get out the oxy-settling torch with new exhaust, and you'd put the thing up there and it'd hang down. Someone was earlier complaining about his uh, Stebro, or um, Monza exhaust hitting all the stuff. And, you know, we just have to, we'd have to heat up, um, heat up and bend the pipes. Then, of course, it didn't look very nice anymore because you buy the new stainless steel system and it looks great. And you put a torch to it to bend it so it fits and it doesn't look so great anymore. But very few people crawl underneath the car to inspect the underside. So the fact that it didn't hit um, at the rear axle or anything was, was more important. So, 
Anyway, so Mr. Brown's from Windsor. I'm looking for, I'm, I got to use my Nexus card. I went out of my way and got a Nexus card and I haven't been able to use it for six months now, almost. Okay, now we've got the next one. Sherry says, thank you. You're welcome, Sherry. That was a midget, as I remember. Uh, Robert Connect. Uh, John, uh, thanks for helping me with my breaks. I got the I got the caliper from Apple this morning. I uh, I ordered uh, hoses from the UK. Nobody had the 5,000 shims except the MGOC in England. So you must you must have been doing a whole lot of work on the front end, setting up some new wheel bearings, and that's that's where that 5,000 shim comes from. So, Robert, yeah, you, you yeah. You advised me to get them, John, and uh, nobody had them. I mean, I, I looked all over the internet, couldn't find okay. them. MGO Otis Club had it. So I ordered a set of uh, a new set of hoses because, as you know, we discussed, we didn't know whether my problem originated with the caliper, caliper that I screwed up or otherwise. Okay. So it's there. We're, now we got to wait for the parts to come from England. It's in the garage. Uh, so, so when you, but when, uh, really appreciate all your help on it. Oh, you're very welcome. When you weigh in next time, two weeks from now, uh, you can tell us how long that shipment took from England. I don't think it takes very long to get <laughs> get to uh, Canada. I think that's still pretty fast. But um, every, you know, it's it's it used to be when things are running normally, um, you could order from the UK and you could order from Moss, and they'd both arrive on, on the same day. So, so transportation mm -hmm. doesn't end up being the problem that it used to be. So. They were very uh, reasonable. I, I I wanted to know about the shipping before I committed, and I came, I uh, sent them a uh, message, and I got a this morning when I woke up, it was on my email server. So Great. the whole thing is sixteen pounds shipping, which I thought was reasonable enough. Yeah, there's there's some great but places. Thanks again for your help, John. You're welcome. There's some great places in the UK where where you can um, where you can get parts. You got Moss UK, it's like, well, I got Moss America. Why would I buy from Moss UK? Because they have different things than Moss America does. And there's Brown and Gammons, Brown ampersand Gammons, Jerry Brown. Um, he's been around forever. He started his, his uh, shop in about, I think maybe 72, around there, maybe 78, um, 78. About that, that late Brown and Gammons. There's the MG Beehive. Um, they stole. The, I said, well, how about Gordon Strickland? Gordon Strickland used to have a, a the MG Beehive in South Carolina. I don't think he trades it anymore. And um, I asked these people in England. Um, I said, well, what do you think about uh, Gordon Strickland stealing the name from you? And they said, oh no, we stole the name from him. Um, anyway, so there's Beehive, Brown and Gammons. And MG Owners Club, which isn't a really a club at all, it's a business. And they have a huge, huge warehouse. I mean, millions and millions of dollars worth of product there. And they send stuff all, all over. There's also Anglo Parts. Uh, they used to be in Brussels. Um, and I know they were he really heavy in the MGA stuff for a while. I don't know too much about them, but you don't have to shop just in the United States. So it's handier, of course. And during COVID, you know, who knows? Anyway, now we got uh, Frank Cataldo, who let me know that John Esposito from uh, Quantum Mechanics is in Connecticut, not Maryland. He's in Connecticut. And he, that's for the, our gentleman who called in from the UK looking for the, for the MGC overdrive. And, and again, back to you, looking for the overdrive. So send me that email, and I'll, I'll send you a copy of that ad. Um, MGC parts uh, includes a transmission main case only for $60. Okay, all right. So Crystal, here we go. Crystal from Texas. Uh, you can unmute yourself. We're gonna get down to, I'll do about one or two more questions and then I'm gonna be done. Um, Crystal writes and says, while restoring my 1970 MGB, I've got two engines available, an 18GK and an 18V. Both were running engines. Any opinion on which to install? Yes, the newer one. But the problem with the 18V, it may be that the front engine bearing plate is different. The, the bearing plate as in it bears the engine within the car. 
So if it's a 74 and a half or newer, they change the motor mounts on the MGB. And, uh, and the front engine bearing plate will no longer fit the rectangular mounts that you have in your MGB, but changing the front plate is pretty simple. I mean, you gotta take the water pump off and you take the front pulley off and, and, um, and the front pulley, at least on the 18V engine, has timing marks up at 11 o'clock, so that's nice. While the front cover's off, you can change the seal, that's nice. Um, you could take the chain and tensioner off. Oh boy, now it's getting creepy. Um, but while those are off, you can at least change the, the tensioner. Put some new gaskets on, take the, take the engine bearing plate from the 18GK engine, put it back on the 18V engine. So um, that, that, uh, that 18V engine is a lot lighter. I mean, that, en that engine started off in the MGB with five piston rings, five three compression, two oil scrapers. By the time we get up to the 18V engine, we've got three rings, two compression and one oil scraper. This, the connecting rods in the beginning of the MGB engine were really, really heavy. They were so heavy that, and the, the, the rod caps were so big, they had to cut them on an angle because you couldn't get them down through the top of the top of the engine. Well, they went to a real lightweight rod they went to a single spring on the on the uh, cylinder head. They went to um, uh, lighter lifters. It's a much better engine. Those 18 V engines are great, just great. So I'd, I'd go for the 18 V engine any day. Embarrassed that it says 18 V on it? Take the plate off the 18 GK and stick it back on it. You know, who cares? You know, you're into originality. Um, okay. So, so. Thank you. You're very welcome. Very well, very welcome. And oh my gosh, am I down? Am I down to the end of my questions? And it's 9:30. I answered all the questions that I had tonight. Hey, thank you very kindly, everybody. Still on? We got 85 people still on. There's still time to go to my website and press the PayPal button. Um, and I enjoy having everybody here, especially the guys, especially, especially everybody. But we've got people that I recognize tonight from from. Uh, England, Australia, even though he's a Triumph owner, um, is, uh, his son's got the MG80. And, and, uh, and England, and of course Canada and the United States. So thanks very, very much. Our next one will be two weeks from tonight. I'm gonna do these twice a month, the first and third Thursdays. So the, you know, or not Thursdays, Tuesdays. So the first one, you know, just happens to be the first this time. So, um, so, and I guess the next time, oh my gosh, we're, we'll have to do something in, in no, November because I'm not doing this. I'm watching the returns on TV. Um, um, so that's, that's my, that's my, uh, that's my excitement. Um, so we'll do, we'll do something in November, but anyway, next time I'll try to give an, uh, um, a more um, passionate appeal for your favorite workshop tool and, and uh, we can all bring our, our special spanners and so forth and hold them, hold them right up to the, to the camera so we can see them. So anyway, thanks. I'm gonna unmute everybody. Uh, well, wait, it says mute all, but I'm gonna, I, I, wanna, I want to unmute all. Ask all to unmute. So you can unmute. There's a bunch of here we got somebody watching TV or listening to the radio. Anyway. Hey, thanks, John. Hi, thanks, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Good night. Good night, John boy. Hey, John boy. Yeah, okay. Mike, it's a pleasure. And, uh, you, you guys, you guys in Australia, I guess you can have lunch now yeah, not in New Zealand. So anyway, Dennis, oh, sure. oh, Noreen, so it says no, Noreen, but I don't know if there's a Noreen there or not. So Mark, John, so anyway, Kurt Johnson, thank you very, very much for being here. Bobo Tanner, if you're still there someplace. And um, it's always a pleasure. I, I, I enjoy talking to everybody. Boys. Somebody's getting a lot of noise in the background, huh?
Anyway, all right. Why does it not last? Done. 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 Done.